What is going on, guys? This is Tyler Breck from T-Bone MMA. So it's finally time for UFC 244, headlined by Nate Diaz and Jorge Masvidal for the BMF belt. Dwayne The Rock Johnson is handing out the belt. There's so many things to go over in this fight, but even though this is sort of a spectacle we got going on here, don't get it twisted. This is one heck of a fight card from the bottom to the very top. This is just a completely insane card with stacked fights from the beginning to the very end. And like I said, multiple times throughout the kind of the previews of the show that I've been doing, um, like if you've been following along on my community posts that I've been posting on uh, YouTube, this undercard could be its own ESPN card and just be stacked. This is how stacked of a card that we have. So it's basically, how, how, I, I, can't even, I can't even describe it. I'm so excited. Here's Bruce Buffer with my new intro, and I'll get things kicked off. And now, presenting the champion, fighting out of the red corner, this man is a podcaster. He stands six feet two inches tall, weighing in at 185 pounds, podcasting out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, Presenting the host of T-Bone MMA Podcast, Tyler T-Bone Brack. All right. Thank you very much, Bruce Buffer. So like I said before, every, like every single fight car, I'm going to do something a little bit different here. So as more viewers are starting to filter in a little bit, this is what I'm going to be doing. I have all my notes. I was able to find time. I actually had kind of a light work week through... Um, or for my paramedic school, and I was able to, to crank out all the notes for the fights. I will go over the notes, and I will also have interactive discussions with you after I go over my notes. So that's how I'm going to be doing this. Okay, I'll have the fighters' names up in the corner. You know, I should be up here. And then in between that, keep up the hard work. I appreciate it, James. Is someone going to fill in T-Bone when he's fighting Corey Anderson? You know what? I actually I actually had Vicente Luque win in that fight, but I figured I have to change it to Wonder Boy because of the situation here. But anyway, to begin the card, we got Julio Arce against Hakim Dawadi with a 145 pound division. Let me tell you something. To kick off this card, we this is one of the best fights really on this fight uh, on this card in in its entirety. So what, for, by the way, if you guys are following along with my picks that I have up here. For the little triangle that I have in the upper right-hand corner, on the upper right-hand corner, that's what I have predicted to be fight of the night. And I truly believe that this fight and the main event, Jorge Masvidal, Jorge Masvidal against uh, Nate Diaz, is going to be fight of the night. That's how highly I think of this fight, Julio Arce against Hakeem Dewadu. To, to kick off this card, too, combined record of 7-2 and two in, their mixed martial, in their UFC careers, this is one heck of a fight to kick off this card between two stand-up artists. Nice arm triangle in the nice arm triangle in the intro. I appreciate it, brother. Anyway, in the 145 pound division, we got Julio Arce against Hakeem Dewadu. Julio Arce is from the United States. He's got a record of 16 victories with three losses, with four knockouts, five submissions, and seven decision victories. Hakeem Dewadu is from Canada. He's got a record of 10 victories with one loss and one draw, with seven knockouts, zero submissions, and three decision victories. Julio Arce stands at five foot seven, has a 70 inch reach, and Hakeem Dewadu stands at five foot eight, has a 73 and a half inch reach. Let me get you all up here real quick. I'll also have it followed along. I should have had this up earlier, my bad. I'll have it up on the UFC website so you all can see the fighters as well. All right. So to kick off this card, Julio Arce against Hakeem Duwadi. Let's start off with Julio Arce. He's got a record of four victories and one loss in his UFC career. And let me pull this up. Where he defeated Dan Ige via unanimous decision back at UFC 220 back in January 2018. And then his next fight defeated Daniel Timor via rear naked choke uh, back in June 2018 in the third round. Defeated Shaman, or excuse me, lost to Shaman Rice via very close split decision. I'll get into that a little bit more. And his last fight knocked out Julian Arosa via head kick knockout in the third round of their fight back in May of 2018. Uh, Julian Arosa was, by the way, his opponent, Julian Arosa, is six foot one. And had a 74 and a half inch reach, but he did not really use that reach in said fight. Let me pull you down here. He didn't really use his reach very much in that fight. His opponent, Julian Arosa, he decided to stay in the pocket. It was actually it was, it was actually Arce that was backing up, being the counter fighter, and he's also a Golden Gloves state champion back in 2011. 
And uh, that's what we really saw. He's got really, he's really, really good off his back foot. He's got very good head movement. And then eventually, after a missed left cross, he came back with a head kick. It was beautiful to see. He's missed with a left cross, came up over the top of the head kick, and ended up knocking out Julian Arosa. And in his fight against uh, Shaman Marais, which he eventually lost via split decision, um, by the way, he's 8-1 and one at 145 pounds since his recent move to 145 pounds. His only loss was a split decision loss to Shaman Marais. And that fight was one of the most bloody fights that I've ever seen. It's not necessarily bloody like you normally think of it, like blood dripping down the face. I'm talking in terms of even distribution of blood splatters throughout the cage and outside of the ops gun. There's literally blood, there's literally blood on all the cameras. Or not on all the cameras, on a few of the cameras outside of the octagon between these two, Shaman Marais and uh, Julio Arce. And that kind of shows the type of fighter that he is. Golden Gloves champion in 2011. He's the ring of combat 135 pound champion, which he defended three times before losing to Brian Kelleher twice. So two out of his three losses in his career is to eventual UFC veteran Brian Kelleher. And he eventually won the ring of combat 145 pound championship and went on to defend that belt twice. Then he was on Dana White's Tuesday that contender series and won his fight via round two TKO and eventually got his spot into the UFC. And by the way, the commentators in the crowd, they also have blood all over them and all over their notes. So that just kind of shows who the ORC is type of, type of fight. He's got an ever evolving kick game as well. That's what we're kind of seeing, especially early on in his, in his uh, UFC career and early on in his career with uh, Ring of Combat. We kind of primarily knew him as a boxer. And yes, he is still has a boxing base constantly on the back foot. It's very interesting to watch um, constantly on the back foot and constantly waiting to counter. But once he goes on the attack, that's what we saw in his fight against Julian Arosa, where he landed that beautifully set up head kick. Sometimes I go to sleep when a UFC event starts because I can't take the suspense and I wake up seeing all the winners and losers in the highlights with my meal and it's so satisfying. I know what you mean there. Love you too, Heather. Anyway, uh, Hakeem Dewadu is a pony. He's got a record of three victories with one loss in his UFC career where he lost to Danny... Danny Henry via guillotine choke in his UFC debut back in March of 2018. Then he defeated Austin Arnett via unanimous decision. Defeated Kyle Botniak via split decision. And then he defeated Yoshir, Yoshinori Horie via head kick knockout back at UFC 240 back in July of this year. Uh, he went 7-0-1 in his World Series of Fighting career. His only draw was against Murat uh, Megomedov. And that was a majority draw. And he actually defeated him in the, in the very next fight after that. Of the TKL. He's also got a 12 0 kickboxing pro career and a 42 and 5 amateur kickboxing career. Okay, in his fight against uh, Yoshihiro Horie, he always pushes forward. He, and he swarmed Horie, and he eventually got the late finish in that fight, landing a beautiful head kick. And he went, he started off his combinations with the body, kind of like Stephen Miocic against Daniel Cormier. That's what we really saw in that fight. Uh, he started to set up strikes to the body later on in that round, and that's what set up the eventual head kick that eventually finished that fight. And the thing about Hakeem Dewadu, what I noticed in some of his fights is that he kind of starts off a little bit low, like, and then it's just his his energy, his pace, his output go, increases exponentially towards the later round. So it's very interesting to see. Um, and that's what's going to be very interesting about this fight. Um, you got a guy that's always, by the way, a head kick dropped him, um, dropped Horier, and eventually finished it with strikes on the ground, which are somewhat unnecessary. Of his, of his total strikes, he lands 5.91 significant strikes per minute and only absorbs 2.19 uh, in his UFC career. He's also got one performance in the night bonus, if I, didn't, if I failed to mention that earlier. And 44% of his strikes land to the head, 24% to the body, and 32% to the leg. So he really mixes it up nicely, and that's what I really... I'm excited to see with Hakeem Dewadu. And that's why I have him winning this fight via round three TKO. And the fight of the night, to be honest with you, Julio Arce and Hakeem Dewadu, two stand-up artists, I think is going to start this card off strong in the fight past prelims. Look at you with the over 5K subs. I know, right? It's nuts. So I'm going to open this up to discussion now. What do you guys think about the first fight on the card? Julio Arce against Hakeem Dewadu in the 145-pound division after I go went through it. So you got Julio Arce who kind of has that background. You should have like 20,000 people in this chat, bro. You have the most clarity and when it comes to explanation and detail. I appreciate it, Connor. What do y'all think about this fight in particular? Because this is definitely one that's going to be overshadowed. There's no doubt about it because it's the first fight on the card and the fight past prelims. And I just wonder exactly how many people are going to be showing up to this event for the very first fight. 
And this one's a doozy, to be honest with you. We got a Golden Gloves champion in boxing with very good head movement and very good, excellent knockout power. He's got four knockouts. And by the way, he's also got five submission victories in his career as well. And part of that is due, due to kind of like that Nate Diaz effect where they kind of swarm sliders and eventually go for a sloppy takedown. And um, eventually get some sort of a submission. Hakeem Dewadu is looking to take your head off all the time. Neon, T-Bone, the people in here are real fans. Love you, man. Keep up the grind. I appreciate it, Neon. Arce has the more experience and I believe stronger. Yes, you are absolutely right. He's 16-3 and three in his mixed martial arts career. And he's only lost to two people, one of those being a split decision loss in a battle. However, in that fight, he actually outstruck Shaman Marais 92-70. to 70. Uh, but he actually lost the significant strikes battle, 50 to 64, and was knocked down four times in that fight. Shows that he's a tough guy to be taken out. So I would think this really comes down to, and it might sound crazy, uh, crazy simplified, but I really think this comes down to who's the better stand-up artist. And I think Hakeem Dewadu has a little bit more of a diverse game that might be able to throw Julio Arce off his game a little bit. But however, you are exactly right, Julio Arce. Uh, what's, up, what's up, Brandon Dirks? Yeah, that's true, exactly. Um, who the RSA does have that experience to deal with it, so it's going to be very interesting to see. And by the way, the winner of this fight, I think, will definitely have a lot more implications to get a top ten, top fifteen opponent in the one hundred forty five pound division because these two guys have so much to offer to this division, and it's really gone overlooked because it's such a hype card. This could definitely be a main a main card slot on a regular ESPN ESPN Plus card. And everybody would be kind of drooling over it because this is one heck of a fight. And it's just gone completely um, swept under the rug, rightfully so, because this is one of the biggest cards. But I do, I'm do i always an advocate for the prelim fighters. And Hilo Arce against Hakeem Dewadu is just one of those fights that you really can't miss. And I know I'm hyping this up a little bit. What's up, Tommy Arnold? I know I'm hyping this fight up a little bit, but it shows how good this fight card is going to be. UFC 244 live at Madison Square Garden. I believe it starts 6.30 p.m. Eastern time on the Fight Pass early prelims. Starts off with Julio RCK against Hakeem Dewadu. This right here is a fight that you cannot miss. And I truly believe it when I say, by the way, if you guys are just joining in, I have all my picks up on the board here. And the triangle in the upper right corner is my pick for fight of the night. I got two of them. And then the bottom right corner is going to be my performance of the night picks. And I truly believe it. I truly mean it when I say it. This fight could certainly be the fight of the night. No doubt about it. And that's including all the fights that are ahead of us as well. I was looking for Arce by a third round stoppage. The opposite of your pick, T-Bone. Okay. Um, it would be awesome to see a complete submission underground versus Steven Thompson like Jones versus Henderson did. Oh, you compete. Oh, my goodness. You, me compete. You realize that he's a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right? You, you do realize that. He would absolutely annihilate me, okay? So I appreciate your guys' in, uh, input. So we'll move on to the next fight. I'm really happy that y'all are kind of under... Uh, y'all appreciate um, this fight past prelim fight because I can't get enough of it. Julio Arce against Hakeem Dewadu, the 145-pound division. All right, the next fight on the card is between... Let me get this up here real quick. Between Lyman Good against Chance Rettencount in the 170 pound division. Lyman Good, he's from the United States. He's got a record of 20 victories with five losses and one no contest, with 10 knockouts, three submissions, and seven decision victories. He's taking on Chance Rettencount. He's from the United States. He's got a record of 14 victories with three losses, with six knockouts, three submissions, and five decision victories. Lyman Good stands at six foot zero and has a 74 inch reach. And Chance Rain counter stands at six foot two and has a seventy-five inch reach. Lyman Good, he's got a record of two victories with two losses in his UFC career, where he defeated Andrew Craig via knockout back in July of 2015. They lost to Alessio Seleski de Santos uh, via split decision back in July of 2017, and then in his and then in his last two performances, defeated Ben Saunders via round one knockout back at UFC 230. But then in his last fight, lost to Damian Maya via round one rear naked choke back in February of 2019. That's a huge step up the competition. And da Damian Maya just choked out Ben Askren, okay? I don't hang, hang that over Lyman Good's head, head at all. He's the former Cage Fury Fighting Championships 170-pound champion. He also has a 9-3 record in Bellator and was the former Bellator 170-pound champion. However, that was back in 2010 when Bellator was still in its early days. I was flipping through YouTube TV and wasn't expecting to see you. Keep up the good work. I appreciate it, Charles. Thank you. The Rock is going to announce his presidential run. Could you imagine? <laughs> 
Can you also upload some more of your fights? I need to fight more, honestly. That's really, that's all I got. <laughs> I'm not sure who is going to win, but I'm looking forward to it. Exactly. Curious to see Rhett Encounter. I think this is a very good fight for Chance, Rhett Encounter, and that's who I had winning this fight. Well, I'll get to that in just a second here. Um, he was a former 100, 100, Bellator 170 pound champion back in 2010. However, he lost it to Ben Askren, and he also lost in the Bellator season seven 170 pound tournament against Andre Koreshkov. So fought some of the best that the Bellator 170 pound division had to offer at that time. He also lost the Ultimate Fighter bid back in 2014, losing his entry fight to get into the house. Saunders, however, in his last victory against Ben Saunders at back at UFC 230, where he finished that fight via round one knockout, I'm not taking anything away from that victory, but let's just put this into perspective. Ben Saunders is now one in five in his last six fights. It was one in three going into that match. It was was finished multiple times going into that match. So it's uh, kind of interesting to see. It's definitely a statistic that's worth noting. He's also in a second degree black belt in Tiger Shulman's mixed martial arts. Tiger Shulman in uh, upstate New York has got a handful of fighters on this card, so he's going to have a very busy night. Good as a Bellator bet. Exactly. Bellator back in 2000. He was a, a Bellator 170 pound champion at, back in 2010. This is before Andre Korshkov. This is before um, This is before Ben Askren. It's nuts. And actually, the title changed hands against Ben Askren, which is kind of funny to see. Um, he lands a whopping 5.18 significant strikes per minute and absorbs 6.14. And he's got a 6 minute and 57 second average fight time in the UFC. He's taking on Chance Rett Encounter. Chance Rent County. He's got a record of two victories with one loss in his UFC career. By the way, Lyman Good is a black belt Brazilian jiu-jitsu with three submission victories, including three year of chokes. Chance Rent County. He's got a record of two victories with one loss in his UFC career. With a unanimous decision loss against Bilal Muhammad in his UFC debut back in June of 2018. Bilal Muhammad is one of the most underrated 170 pound um, prospects in the UFC as of right now. Hey, Wonder Boy, what's up, Pete? How's the medical rounds going? It's a lot, let me tell you. It's a lot, but I'm getting through it and I actually had a little bit of a lighter workload this week, so that's why I was able to dedicate a lot more time to this. Anyway, uh, Chance Right Encounter also went to, oh, he defeated Dar uh, Kyle Stewart via Rene Kachok and he also defeated Ismail Nadura via an Am's decision in his last fight back in July of 2019. He went two and one in his Bellator career and he raided his rounds in the regional scene back in Oklahoma in a semi-pro career. And he also, his, his fight, last fight against, uh, his fight that where he finished Kyle Stewart, Stewart took that fight on a week's notice going into that fight. Something worth noting a little bit there, not taking anything away from Chance Red Encounter. And his fight against Ishmael Nadurov, Ishmael Nadurov is 18-2 and two going into that match. 18-2 and two going into that match. And he eventually got a unanimous decision, or excuse me, a split decision victory. Um... Excuse me, that should be a, a unanimous decision victory, excuse me, where he defeated um, Ishmael Nadurov 29 to 27, 29 28, and 30 27. He controlled 11 minutes and 5 seconds of that match, a, 50, a three round fight, and it was just all in all a dominant victory for Chance Red Encounter. I see this fight going very similarly. I think Chance Red Encounter is a little bit bigger, a little bit longer. I think he's a little bit stronger. I think he's a little bit relatively even on the ground. There's one thing that Lyman Good has in this fight is a good ground game. And I'm not sure if he'll be able to expose that in this fight. So that's why I have Chance Red Encounter. Um, I, that's why I got Chance Red Encounter in this fight. What do y'all think? Chance Red Encounter or Lyman Good in the 170 pound division? The second fight on the fight pass early prelims. And another good one, let me tell you. And in fact, this really shows how stacked this card is. Because if there's one fight that I'm like, you guys could probably miss, it's this one. And this one is one heck of a fight as well in the 170 pound division. I personally think right now, the top five of that division, deadly, deadly right now. And it's one of the most hot divisions. Like the great George St. Pierre once said, MMA is like the stock market. And right now, the 170 pound division is at the top of the stock market. I'm not impressed by your performance. Anyway, Lyman Good against the Chance Red Encounter. What do y'all think? I was going to not deserve any of that. I still don't see his trash talk. Oh my goodness, yeah. Good by submission. I could see that. If there's any likely possibility, I see Chance Red Encounter via an Adams decision or Lyman Good via submission. And let me tell you something. With these picks, I kind of went off my impulse in all reality. Um, there was some research behind it and there was some um, some reason behind it. However, Derek Lewis knocking out Playboy even off via round three knockout. That's all impulse. I want to see that so bad. Stephen Wonderboy Thompson winning round three in Adams decision. 
I don't think Wonderboy's going to win that fight, but I got to go with it because I look like Wonderboy, I guess. And there's a little bit of an impulse going into these fights. And these fights are so hard to pick. I could just as easily get all of these wrong as I get all of these right. That's what's nuts about this card. Um, that's how hard of a fight, that's how hard these fights are, are to, uh, to call. What do y'all have? Retton Carter is a live underdog. Is he actually? Lyman Good is a warrior, but I'm also picking Chance to submit good. Late, late Lyman Good gets really sloppy. That's kind of interesting. That's not how I would see that. MA Cetra Podcast. What do you think of the chances that if, George, that if Jorge Masvidal wins, Nick Diaz will come back to fight him? I don't know. That's, a, that's an interesting one. But again, I'll t- kind of talk really a little bit about that a little bit more. I'm going to try to keep this a little bit more specific to the fights that are at hand. So Lyman Good against Chance Retton Count of the Fight Pass early prelims. Um, go with your gut, Timo. There's a lot of neurons in your gut. <laughs> gut feelings is where it comes from. Exactly. Nick Diaz Army. So the output from Lyman Good and the ground game is going to be very interesting to, to see here. Heavyweight's going three rounds. Second round TKO. That's a possibility as well. However, Derek Lewis makes his money with the third round knockouts for some reason. I think it'll happen again. If there's one event that's, that is going to happen, the BMF, I got some stories to tell about these fights. Because for those of you that don't know, Blake Oye Ivanov was stabbed in the heart. He was stabbed in the heart, put in a medically induced coma for six months or for multiple weeks. After that incident, went on to fight Six months later, after getting stabbed in the heart, he's got a scar right here. It kind of looks like Nogueira's scar on the back, and he's just got a hole right here. He went on to fight six months after that and go on a four-fight winning streak. That was until he lost to Alexander Volkov. That's another BMF. Darren Till got stabbed twice in the back. Survived and is fighting now. There's a lot of BMFers on this belt, on this uh, fight card. I think 98% of anyone in this chat had no idea there's actually neurons in their gut. Google it. I, I did not know that. Anyway, that's a very exciting fight in the 170 pound division to kick off this card. All right, the next fight is the feature bout in the fight pass early prelims between number five ranked Jennifer Maya. Ah. Jennifer Maya gets number one ranked Caitlin Chukagian. A very important fight in the women's 125 pound division. I mean, look at their rec- look at their rankings right now. Um, this fight has really flown on the radar because this has serious title implications. And the winner of this fight is probably going to fight um, Valentina Shevchenko for the women's 125-pound champion. Let's, let's just be real here. I know Valentina Shevchenko. She seems untop- untouchable right now. Um, but this is the implications that we have here. Uh, Jennifer Maya against Caitlin Chikagian. Whoever wins this fight, this is probably a number one contender fight. Because think about it. Caitlin Chikagian is number one ranked in the division. There's really no, no other names for her in a fight to get to the title. In fact, I was pushing for Caitlin Chikagian to get this fight over, why am I blanking? Over Liz Carmouche. So it was kind of interesting to see. So this is a very important fight in the women's 125 pound division. And yet another fight that's worth noting on the fight pass prelims. So again, fight pass prelims start at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. So wherever that is for you. And T-Bone and Mabel for sure. I will try to be live. I can't make any guarantees as of yet because I still have a medical, I still have a clinical at the hospital tomorrow. I can't make any guarantees at exactly what time I'll be here, but I'm 90% sure that I'll be able to cover these fights 100%. Also, how'd you get the Bruce Buffer to do the intro? It was something that I did way back in the day, like 2017. I was still in high school at the time. And um, yeah, he was doing this promotion and I paid a swift amount of change for that. (laughs) Let's just say that. Anyway, Jennifer Maya, she's from Brazil. She's got a record of 17 victories and five losses with four knockouts, four submissions, and nine decision victories. Number one ranked Caitlin Chukagans from the United States. She's got a record of 12 victories with two losses with two knockouts, one submission, and nine decision victories. Jennifer Maya stands at five foot four as a 64 in 64 inch reach, and Caitlin Chukagian stands at five foot nine as a 69, 68 inch reach. A five inch height advantage and a four inch reach advantage going in favor of Caitlin Chukagian. Number five ranked Jennifer Maya. She's got two victories and one loss in her UFC career with losses to Liz Carmouche via unanimous decision back in July of 2018. And she also defeated Alexis Davis via unanimous decision and in her last fight defeated Roxanne Mataferi via unanimous decision back in July of 2018. However, Jennifer Maya missed weight for that match against Roxanne Mataferi at 120, weighed in at 129 pounds. 
I wrote that because it's worth noting, and she was the only fighter to miss weight on this fight card, where she weighed, I believe, at 127 pounds, missing the weight class by one pound. Uh, she went 4-2 and two in her Invicta career and ended with a three-fight win streak and won the Women's 125-pound championship in Invicta. Uh, she defeated Vanessa Pantoro uh, to win the Invicta 125-pound championship, and then she defended the belt against Roxanne Mataferi, uh, where she won that fight via split decision, and she went on to defeat her next opponent, uh, via an decision to defend that belt for a second time back in December of 2017 before being signed to the UFC and eventually losing to Liz Carmouche in her UFC debut. And then right now is on a two-fight winning streak and very impressive performances over Alexis Davis and Roxanne Montefiore. I know they're kind of easy to look over, but they are certainly the top of the 125-pound division. Were you a senior in 2017? Yes, yes. It just seems so long. I've done so many things since then. Uh, Jennifer Myers, she's gotten eight and one in her last nine fights. And she's got a 4.11 significant strikes per minute, and she only absorbs 3.42. Uh, she was actually outstruck by Liz Carmouche, 218 to 110 in that fight. That was a three-round fight, by the way. That was how high output that fight was. And she was outstruck 83 to 29 in the significant strikes department. And she defended in her last fight against, or excuse me, she outstruck Roxanne Modafferi 83 to 29 and defended nine takedowns. From Roxanne Modafferi in that fight. I'll leave that as it is. Keep on keeping on, T-Bone. See you tomorrow night. I'll see you later, Kyle. Good picks. I appreciate it, Caleb. Hopefully, y'all are able to see that. I think I should probably... I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that. But anyway, let's move on. Jennifer Maya, like I said, after she's actually has... She actually outstrikes her opponent one strike per minute, uh, 4.11 to 3.42. That's actually very significant, especially for this fight card. That's a very significant amount. And considering the fact that she was outstruck by Liz Carmouche, essentially two to one, that just shows how dominant she was against Alexis Davis and Roxanne Modafferi. And she defended nine takedowns against Roxanne Modafferi in that fight. So her takedown defense is on point. Of course, that's against Roxanne Modafferi. He's primarily known as a jiu-jitsu fighter, not necessarily a NCAA wrestler. However, with number one ranked Caitlin Chikagian, I don't think that she's going to try to take this fight down to the ground. Duadu is seriously a great. Do not miss that one. Yes! I've been saying that for a while now. Hakeem Duadu, that's going to be a good one. I'm honestly not bluffing. I would rather pay to watch you commentate by the pay-per-view. I appreciate it, but go watch the paper. You'll regret it if you don't, but I'll always be here if you choose not to. Okay, number one, right, Caitlin Chikagan. She's got a record of five victories with two losses in her UFC career. She defeated Lauren Murphy um, in her UFC debut back in 2016. Then she lost to Liz Carmouche at UFC 205. This was early on in her career at Madison Square Garden. Liz, Liz Carmouche, I be, actually, I believe Caitlin Chikagan was the very first female fighter to step foot well, I think there, she was the very first fighter to step foot in New York City. Let me confirm that because I think she was. I think she was the very first UFC 205. I think Caitlin Chikagian was the very first fighter to step foot to step foot at the Madison Square Garden. Well, she fought in the very first fight in New York. She fought in the very first fight in New York City. There was fights back at UFC 9 in Buffalo, New York way back in the day. But she lost to Liz Carmouche in the very first women's fight, or the very first mixed martial arts UFC fight in New York City. So a little piece of history there and a little bit of a um, little piece of history there and a little bit of food for thought right there. Caitlin Chikagian, first ever UFC fighter to fight in New York City. Where is Mama Tebow at tonight? Glad you brought that up. Let me take a second here. Shout out to Mama T-Bone. It is her birthday today. So happy birthday, Mama. I love you very much. It's Mama T-Bone's birthday today. Um, Caitlin Chikagian, back to this. Um, then after losing to Liz Carmouche via an decision, she defeated Irene Aldana via split decision. Then she defeated Mauro Romero Borrello via an decision at 125 pounds, making her UFC debut at 125 pounds. Then she defeated Alexis Davis via an decision, lost to Jessica I via split decision. Then in the last fight, defeated Joanne Calderwood via an decision back in June 2019. She's a brown belt Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and she went 3-1 and one at featherweight in the UFC with her only loss to Jessica Ivey, a split decision, albeit a very close fight. By the way, that fight against Lisa Carmouche was at 135. I birthed it to the mother of T-Bone. Yes. Uh, she was the former Cage Fury Fighting Championships 125 and 135-pound champion. 
and she actually gets outstruck by her by her opponents. And part of that is due to her early UFC career. She was kind of outstruck, especially by Liz Carmouche early on in her career. But she's actually outstruck by her opponent. She lands 4.28 significant strikes per minute and absorbs 4.68. And she was outstruck by Joanne Calderwood in her last fight, 141 to 108, and was taken down three times. It was a close fight each round, and Kim Kagan kind of edged her way. It was such a close fight, and I remember watching that fight. I had that fight going to Caitlin Chikagian. It was a very close one. So, in summary, this is going to be a very interesting fight to determine more than likely who's going to face Valentina Shevchenko. I got Caitlin Chikagian winning this fight. Let's just say that. How she will fare against Valentina Shevchenko, let me tell you something. I've said this before, and I've said it lots of times. If there's one person right now, and this isn't saying a lot right now, if there's one person that has the best chance of beating Valentina Shevchenko at 125 pounds currently... Kaylee Chikagian is the girl right now. But I don't foresee that ever happening. But this is the kind of the state of the situation that we're in at the women's 125 pound division. There's just not a whole lot of talent. I shouldn't say there's not a whole lot of talent because both these girls are very talented. However, we got Valentina and Shevchenko. Uh, Kaylee Chikagian and Jennifer Maya, extremely high level talent. I'm not taking anything away from them. But Valentina Shevchenko is just a little, a lot a bit higher at the moment. But everybody's got to fight his chance. If there's one person that I believe that can beat Valentina, or has the best chance at beating Valentina Shevchenko at women's 125 pounds currently, that would be number one Marie Kate Luchikagian. I think she pulls off another decision victory. And surprisingly enough, despite me thinking that I actually did have Hakeem Dewadu winning the third round um, TKO, and that's going to be a common trend. I got a lot of the late finishes going into this card. I like the late finishes a lot. I actually have every single pick you do. Oh, really, Caleb? So what do you all think about that fight? Do you think the winner... Let me ask you something to inter, to um, interact with you guys a little bit. Do you think the winner of Jennifer Maya and Kaylee Jukagian will go on to face Valentina Shevchenko? And if so, how do you think they will fare in that fight? I'll give you a couple seconds to answer here. I like Connor for his confidence and verbal assault in 2002. Yikes. Winners at least. Actually, every single pick that you do. Pete got his belt from the UFC. From <laughs> Wait, did he actually? I kind of forgot about Pete. How's he doing? Is Maya related to Maya? No. I want to see Valentina against Nunez. Yes. Yes. I don't see Valentina Shevchenko losing in a while, especially at 125 pounds. If there's, any, if there's any point in her career that she loses, it's really only against Amanda Nunez, in my opinion. I really think... Rest in peace, Pete. No longer with us. Exactly. I don't miss him. She had to paint it black as well. So that's going to be a very interesting fight between Jennifer Maya and Caitlin Chikagian to feature the uh, 125 or to feature the fight pass prelims. Um, has a lot of title implications, in my opinion. All right, the next fight on the card is the first fight on the prelims on ESPN two. You banned Pete. Yes, I did. Okay, I got to fix this here for a second. There we are. Andre Arlovsky against Jarazino Ros Rosenstruck. I have had a very tough time pronouncing that. I pronounced it. I tried pronouncing it several times before this fight. But the first fight on the ESPN2 prelims, we got Andre Arlovsky against Jarazino uh, Rosowski <laughs> Rosenstruck. Andre Arlovsky, he's from Belarus. He's got a record of 28 victories with 18 losses and two no contests. Jarazino Rosenstruck. Um, it's from Suriname. I, I don't even know where that is, so please help me out here. He's got a record of eight victories, zero loss, with seven knockouts, zero submissions, and one decision victory. And let's take a look for a second here. Andre is my champ. This card is fantastic, top to bottom. By the way, for those of you that haven't been following along, I highly recommend going to T Bone MMA and go to the community section. I have a series of polls that I have, and I was going to interact with you guys a little bit more through that. So let's take a look at what y'all think about these under this undercard specifically. Let me pull this up here. Right now we have 171 votes. If you guys haven't voted, please make your opinion heard. Okay, I asked you guys, what is your favorite fight 
on the fight on the fight pad, not the fight pass early prelims, but the ESPN two prelims. And we got Andre Arlovsky against Jarzana Rosenstruck. We got Brad Tavares against Edmund Sabazian. That's my personal favorite. Shane Burgos against Mark Juan Americani and Corey Anderson against Johnny Walker. And overwhelmingly, you guys picked Corey Anderson against Johnny Walker. I also picked none. Only care about Diaz versus Masvidal, and that actually was pretty significant. That actually took me by a little bit of a surprise. Um, but 9% of you picked Andre Arlovsky against Jarzino Rosenstruck. Um, so that's actually no shock there. I'm extremely excited for this fight. And to kick off the ESPN2 prelims, and I just kind of wonder exactly how much of a following, because I can't think of any major sports network, sports event that's going on right now. So I truly think that these ESPN2 ratings are going to be slightly elevated, considering how big of a card this will be. And I think that Andre Alaska and Jarazina Rosenstruck is going to be a great fight to kick off, kick off the fight card for a lot of people that don't have the UFC Fight Pass prelims. Anyway, Andre Olovsky, he's, got, he's from Belarus. He's got a record of 28 victories with 18 losses and 2 no contest with 17 knockouts, 3 submissions, and 8 decision victories. He stands at 6'3", 171-inch reach. Already went through Rosenstruck's record. Uh, he stands at 6'4", has a 70 and a 78 and a half inch reach. As the great um, Mike Goldberg once said, virtually identical. Andre Olofsky, he's got a record of 17 victories with 12 losses and one no contest in his UFC career. He's went 3-8 and eight with one no contest in his last 12 fights. However, 3-3 three and three with one no contest in his last seven. So after going on a relatively, let's just say he went on a skid to say the least. After losing many fights in a row, he's gone 3-3. Three and three. He's able to pull off a slightly better record than he, I was expecting. I was expecting him to kind of fall off the rails and collapse there for a little while. Um, but however, 3-3 three, three and 1-0 no contest in his last 7 fights isn't bad. I'm proud of you, Andre Olofsky, and he's still a fun fighter to watch, I might add. Back in November 2017, he defeated Junior Albina via unanimous decision, and then he went on to defeat Jeff Stephen Shrew via unanimous decision. And then he had a unanimous decision loss against Tai Tui Vasa, unanimous decision loss against Shamil Abdurahimov, and actually had a no contest against Walt Harris. Walt Harris especially Walt Harris originally won that fight via split decision, however, it was over, overturned to a no contest due to marijuana. I'll let you all discuss that. And then he had a split decision loss against Augusto Saki, and then his last fight defeated Ben Rothwell via round three unanimous decision. He went 8-5 with one no contest between his UFC career. And by the way, early on in his UFC, but let me just pull up his record. Why not? Let's take a let's take a look down memory lane right now because Andre Olaski has probably had the most how do I, what's the word I'm looking for here? Most historic heavyweight, heavyweight title or heavyweight career. Let's just say you don't see many heavyweights have the kind of rear career that Andre Arlovsky had because he made his UFC debut back at UFC 228, back in the year 2000. I was a baby. I was just a baby back then. Let's take a look here. In his UFC debut, he defeated Aaron Brink back at UFC 28 back in November 17th of, of the year 2000, just 55 seconds. Then he went on to lose against Rico Rodriguez and Pedro Hizzo, both via knockout. Then he went on a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up, six fight winning streak, defeating Ian Freeman, Vladimir Vatyashenko, uh, Wesley Correra, Tim Sylvia, Justin Eller, Elliers, and Paul Boltinello. Paul Boltinello. Before losing, by the way, he won the title in that he won the interim title, then defended the title, and that was this was after Randy Couture eventually went on to vacate the title, making him the unified UFC heavyweight championship, uh, which he won the interim belt, defended the interim belt, was eventually promoted to the unified champion after Randy Couture had some contract disputes with the UFC and eventually left, and then he defeated Paul Botanella via first round via first round knockout in just 15 seconds to defend the heavyweight championship. Before losing to Tim Sylvia in just the very first round by like UFC 59 and that would be the end of his title run in the UFC and then he lost to Tim Sylvia again via name decision in their rematch just a few months later and then after that defeated Marco Cruz, Fabrizio Verdum, uh, Jacob Bryan and then eventually left the UFC and then went on to Affliction. This is a very excellent time for me to plug this in. Donald, our president, Donald J. Trump is supposedly supposed to be going to this event. Just adds to the what is going onness of this event. I'm not complaining. I enjoy it. Affliction, by the way, the tie in there. Affliction used to be owned by our former president, by our current president, Donald Trump. 
and he went on to knock out Ben Rothwell in the third round. Then he also went on to knock out Roy Nelson at Elite XC, <laughs> which Elite XC, <laughs> what a trip down memory lane here. He's fought everywhere. Did he fight? I don't think he ever fought in Pride, though. He's fought pretty much everywhere. He fought in M1. He fought in Affliction. Fought in Strike Force and Elite XC, but actually did not fight in fight in Pride. That's actually kind of that's just funny considering where everywhere that he's fought. Fighting Elite XC, uh, where he defeated Roy Nelson. Then he eventually went on to lose to Fedor Emelianenko back in the Affliction early days. <laughs> back in the I should early days of Affliction. There was only two events, and he fought in both of them. And then he went on to lose against Fedor Emelianenko. And then lost to Brett Rogers via TKO. Lost to Antonio Bigfoot Silva. And lost to Sergei Ter Karatonov uh, in Strike Force as well. Was eventually cut from Strike Force, in which I thought was the lowest point of his career, which, in t which he would never recover from. But look at this. Defeated Ray Lopez via TKO in the third round. Defeated Travis Ironman Fulton. Travis Fulton has the most fights in mixed martial arts history, and it's not even close. Knocked him out. Get this. Knocked him out in the very last second of that fight. Three minutes, or th third round, four minutes and 59 seconds. And a fight that he was losing is Travis Fulton. Travis Fulton, in his over 300 fight career, that was by far the biggest fight of his career. And he nearly won that fight against Andre Arlovsky. Let's just say that. If, there was, if he had went on one more second, he would have won that fight. But Andre Arlovsky pulled out the victory. Then he had a no contest against Tim Sylvia due to illegal soccer kicks that he landed in the second round of their of their uh, rubber match back in 2012. Then he defeated David Cole via TKO, defeated Mike Hayes via unanimous decision for losing to Anthony Rumble Johnson at World Series of Fighting 2. They wanted to defeat Mike Kyle. And if I'm not mistaken, no, he actually did not win the title, World Series of Fighting title. And then he came out of the UFC and he was he was like TRT Vitor. He came out of the UFC, defeating Brandon Shaw via split decision, knocking out Antonio Bigfoot Silva, knocking out Travis Brown, which was one of my favorite rounds of all time. Then he went on to defeat Frank Mir before losing to Stipe Miocic. And he was one fight away from completely reversing his career and fighting for the heavyweight championship again. That's, what, that's the kind of career that Andre Olofsky had. He went from barely, he went from winning the UFC championship back at, what was that? UFC, UFC 51. That was actually not the rubber match against Tim Sylvia. That was actually their fourth match together, by the way. We won the interim championship back in 2005, and then all the way, January 2016, 11 years later, was one fight away from fighting for the championship again before losing to C.B. Miocic in the first round. Lost to Alistair Overeem, lost to Josh Barnett, lost to Francis Ngani via TKO, and lost to, lost to Marcin Tiberia. Five fight losing streak. I was begging and pleading, Andrei Olavsky, please stop fighting. And then he defeated Junior Albino. I was like, okay. All right, I mean, he got a victory, but please stop fighting. He went out on a win. Please stop fighting. Stefan Struve, he defeated. I was like, oh, does he have some sort of a uh, comeback going on here? They lost to Tai And then I'm like, stop. Please stop. Shamil Abdurakimov, you know, decision loss. Lost to Walt Harris. Overturned to a no contest. Lost to Augusto Sake. But defeated Ben Rothwell in his last fight. You want to talk about an up and down career for Andre Olavsky? He's the guy. But take a look at this. All the records that he holds in his mixed martial arts career was the former UFC heavyweight champion. Before the, he was the former interim UFC heavyweight championship champion. He defended that belt once. And most wins at UFC heavyweight history with 17. Most fights at UFC heavyweight history with 30. And the highest successful takedown defense in UFC heavyweight history at 88.4%. Something worth noting as well. How often do you see a heavyweight go on to fight... 30 fights in their career. That's absolutely nuts. Andre Olaski is one of my heroes. Love him to death. But I hate watching him fight sometimes. I, I just don't want to see him extend his career further than it should. Let's just say that. Um, I went on a very long time talking about Andre Olaski, but it's worth it. He deserves every second of it. He's a brown belt Brazilian jiu-jitsu with three submission victories, including an armbar back in 2000. He had an Achilles lock in 2005 and also had a guillotine choke victory back in the year 2000. So we haven't seen a submission from him in 14 years. That's longer than I'm sure at least one of you have been alive. Anyway, he's, he's a taking on J Jarozino Rosenstruck. Rosenstruck is one inch taller but has a seven inch reach advantage, something that should be worth noting. He's gone 2-0 in his UFC career, defeating Junior Albini via second round TKO, and then defeated Alan Crowder in just nine seconds. Nine seconds. He dropped Crowder with a jab, and that just kind of shows the power that he had. 
He was backing up and dropped Alan Crowder with a jab. And then went on to finish him on the ground with some a hard ground and pound. Just, in fact, just one right hand that he, he, how do I put it? Crowder was kind of down. He was in his guard. And then Rosenstruck grabbed his ankles, matadored him away, just kind of threw his legs away and landed one right hand. And he was out cold. All this in nine seconds. I just described the entire fight for you. And his fight against Junior Albini, um, that was via second round TKO. He was very patient the entirety of that fight. He was very patient, waited for his opportunity, dropped him with the right hand, and eventually turned it on and eventually got the finish there. This is one of the tougher fights that I had to pick. I had to go with the more experienced Andrei Olofsky. But however, there's one fight that I'm the least confident in with my picks. It's, uh, it's this fight in particular. What do y'all think? It's up to you. I'll be turning in tomorrow. I appreciate it, Richard. Thank you. So what do y'all think? Andre Arlovsky, do you think Andre Arlovsky will get this fight done? And this is a tough one. Uh, I did pick Andre Arlovsky for your round three and M's decision. I could just as easily see him losing. There's not a whole lot of routes for victory for Andre Arlovsky because I think, um, however, I do believe that Andre Arlovsky will win this fight via M's decision because I think uh, Rosenstruck is going to patiently wait the entirety of the fight, get Andre Arlovsky possibly hurt, and try to look for a finish, possibly get a little bit tired, a little bit winded once we reach the final final round. Um, but it's going to be an interesting one nonetheless. This ground game is so good. Nathan Diaz won. Um, I don't see this fight ever going to the ground. If it's get, going to the ground, it's Rosenstruck that drops Andre Arlovsky. I think Andre Arlovsky is kind of going to avoid Rosenstruck's power strikes. I think it's going to be a little bit slower of a fight, to be honest with you. My money's on Diaz anyway. Arlovsky, the other guy, had, what, four fights? Eight fights, two of them in the UFC, knocking out Junior Albini and Alan Crowder. Um, however, I'm usually a little bit critical of that. However, in his fight against Junior Albini, Junior Albini does have a lot of UFC experience, albeit not the best experience in the UFC. A lot of y'all going with Arlovsky. The Rock wins by disqualification. I want her to pounds. Do so you think I should cut to 155 or fight at 170? Go to 155. <laughs> the Rock wins by disqualification. Y'all are crazy. Um, the one thing that I was impressed with with Rosenstruck was the fact that he was very patient against Junior Albini. He was very patient, waited for his opportunity, didn't punch himself out. He's not one of those fighters that goes in looking for the kill, burns himself out against an experienced fighter, and then is like, I don't know what to do. He is very patient in that fight. However, I don't think he'll be able to get it done against Andre Olofsky. I think Andre is going to stay on the outside, avoid some of the power strikes, pick him off, and then actually get a unanimous decision victory. Again, most of that was based on experience. What do y'all think about the coat, man? Oh, Google lied to me. So this is going to be an interesting one. The first fight in the ESPN2 prelims, um, and that is Andre Olofsky against Jarazina Rosenstruck. Hopefully, I certainly might be uh, pronouncing that name wrong. All right, next fight. And again, I'm going to go into a lot of depth on these fights. I'm just going to be honest. And this one in particular is one fight that I'm extremely interested in. And let's take a look at what you all have to think about this fight. Because Emin Shabazian is 10-0 in his mixed martial arts career with eight knockouts, one submission, and one decision victory. Is now 3-0 in the UFC. Is 21 years old. And I asked you guys, is he the next big thing in the 185 pound weight class. Is he going to tear through Brad Tavares and eventually get to the top of the division, eventually take on Israel Adesanya and become, Emin Shabazian said it multiple times in his, every single one of his fights in his UFC career. He made his UFC debut when he was just 20 years old. Um, and before that, he was 20 years old and was on the Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series and eventually got signed to the UFC through that. But he said it time and time again. He truly believes that he is going to be the youngest champion in UFC history, and he's certainly on track to do it. He went from being a relative unknown to fighting to being ranked in the 185-pound weight class. He is just running through the division. And at 21 years old, he certainly could be the guy to do it. And I thought that was an unbreakable record. Uh, I believe the record is 23 years and like 200-plus days. Um, Emin Shabazian could certainly do that. Uh, and a victory over Brad Tavares, depending on how effective he is in putting Brad Tavares out, it's going to be very interesting. So let's take a look at what y'all had to think about um, Emin Shabazian. And I probably should have phrased this question a little bit better, but I'll, I'm going with it anyway. All right. 
I ask you guys, is he the real deal now against Ratchavaris? Will he stay undefeated? And what I also implied is, will he eventually take on um, Israel Adesanya? 21% of you thought that. T only 12% of you thought his, he was overhyped. Again, with all of his first round knocks that he has throughout his career, a lot of you, just only 12% of you out of 91 people that voted, 12% of you thought that he was going to rise, 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 and eventually fall. Um, somewhat, th the best example I have in my mind is Cody Garbrandt. And then a lot of you, 67%, the vast majority of you, said he's not the real deal now, but will be in the future. 67% of you believe that he's going to eventually throughout his career, not necessarily 21 years old or 22, 23, wherever he wants to break the record. Don't think he's going to break the record, but eventually could pose a lot of threats to the division. In my opinion, if Ed Sh Emmett Shabazian is going to win this fight, if Emmett Shabazian is going to make a name for himself, he's going to keep on doing what he's doing. I think once he loses one fight, I don't think he'll be able to maintain that. Maintain the hype that he that he has. I'll get to that, and I'll get to that a little bit more depth here in just a second. But let's talk about this fight um, down to the numbers. Number eleven, Rick Brad Tavares. He's from the United States. He's got a record of seventeen victories with five losses, with five knockouts, two submissions, and ten decision victories. He's taking on number thirteen, Rick Edmund Shabazi, and He's from the United States. He's got an undefeated record of ten victories with zero losses. I believe the only undefeated fighter on this card, by the way, with eight knockouts, one submission. No, 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 no. There's one. There's one. Can you name the other one? With eight knockouts, one submission, one decision victory, Brad Tavares stands at six foot one, has a seventy-four inch reach, and Emmett Shabazian stands at six foot two and has a seventy-four inch reach. Let's start off with number thirteen, right? Emmett Shabazian. He's got a record of three victories with zero losses in his UFC career. He defeated Darren Stewart via round three, a split decision in his UFC debut. Then he defeated Charles Bird via thirty-eight second TKO. He defeated Jack Marshman via round one rear naked choke, round one knockout. Excuse me, in just a minute and twelve seconds. Then in his fight previously against Antonio Jones, won that fight via 42nd TKO and Dana White's at Contender Series back in July of 2018. So in just a little over a year, went from relative obscurity fighting on the Dana White's Juice at Contender Series to being the number 13 ranked fighter fighting on one of the biggest cards, uh, biggest cards on the roster, or biggest card of the year. He's going to make a huge name for himself here. Um, Emmett Shabazi went 5-0 and in California with the Extreme Fighting Championships with five knockouts all in the very first round. Trains out of Glendale Fight Club. This is the only thing that has me very, very worried about Emmett Shabazian. His head coach and cornerman is Edmund Tarverdian. Head movement. Edmund Tarverdian. And actually, his fighting against Jack Marshman, he won via, he actually took him down in said fight. Uh, and immediately, he actually submitted Jack Marshman, excuse me, handing him his second submission loss. Jack Marshman is a purple belt. That's something that's worth noting. And eventually, it was Emmett Shabazzian that went in head forward. That's the kind of fighter that he is. Like, remember when I said um, uh, Rosenstruck, the last heavyweight? Even though he's got eight, eight, of nine, eight, eight of his nine victories are via knockout, he's not the kind of guy that punches himself out early on in the round. Emmett Shabazzian. He's looking to take your head off. He is young, and he's got that young fighter's mentality of, I got to get this done now. I got no time for strategy. I'm going to take you out as quick as possible. That's the only critique that I have for Emin Shabazi. He does have a split decision victory in his career. Makes me a little bit worried as he takes on Brad Tavares, who is one of the top of the division and very experienced. I have this fight going to Shabazi. It's a gamble, but I'm doing it. Anyway, number 11 ranked Brad Tavares. By the way, Emmett Shabazzian, like I said before, he was outstruck 92 to 54, and land, but landed 16 takedowns against Darren Stewart in his UFC debut. He's got very good wrestling background as well. Landed 16 takedowns in said fight. Had a tough time keeping him down. Hence why the split decision. He did not control the vast majority of the rounds, but had no problem taking the fight down to the ground. So a relatively high takedown percentage rate in the UFC as of yet. He has stated that he wants to be the youngest UFC champion. Like I said before, he's only 21 years of age. He's taking on, taking on number 11 ranked Brad Tavares. He's got a record of 12 victories, the five losses in his UFC career. And I'm gonna take, I'm gonna go over his record since his round one knockout loss to Robert Whitaker. They wanted to defeat Kyle Magelheis via split decision, defeated Elias Thorado via an decision, defeated Tales Leites via an am decision, defeated Christoph Jocko via round three TKL, before losing to Israel Adesanya via five round am decision back in July of 2018. So in the time that it took Emmett Shabazian to run through the 185-pound prospects to eventually get himself the number 13 ranked, Brad Tavares has kind of been on the sidelines. So this is going to be a very interesting added element as well. 
Hamish Bajian has fought three times in the last little over a calendar year, and Brett Tavares has fought zero times. A little bit of an added, um, a little bit of added interest going into this fight. Can't see how long. I just want to stop in. What's up, Al? Thank you for stopping in. He trained with Ronda as a teenager. You got that right as well. I don't always act as awesome, but when I do, I'm pretty freaking awesome. Stay awesome, my friends. I appreciate it, Connor. <laughs> What's up, Jeff? So, Brad Tavares finished two fights in the UFC, both via knockouts. He had Tico win over Christoph Jocko. It was the first knockout that he had since knocking out Phil Baroni back in 2010. So, if Brad Tavares is going to win this fight, he's going to get this fight to the distance and eventually get a uh, decision victory. That's what we're going to see here. He's been out for a year due to a broken arm that he had, which actually had a lot of complications, which required surgery. So that's why he's kind of been on this little long layoff. And if I'm not mistaken, yes, he was supposed to fight Ian Heisnich back in, back in October 26th, last week. However, Ian Heisnich pulled out, leading him to replace Christoph Jaka. So hence why Brad Tavares steps in, not necessarily on late notice per se, because this is about a month ago. And he already had a fight leading up, in fact, a week prior to this match. Um, so I'm sure Brad Tavares, even though taking this fight on relatively short notice, he already had a fight scheduled, was in fighting shape. It's not like he took this fight out of the blue and eventually stepped in. He was supposed to face off against another extremely high-ranked fighter, Ian Heisnich, who is also Ian Heisnich, who is also a knockout artist in his own right. So relatively similar fighters. Let's get Triple C versus Nunes. <laughs> That's, I'm not even going to acknowledge that. <laughs> I love you, Jeremy, though. <laughs> okay, now I'm having fun. <laughs> so, Edmund Shabazian against Brad Tavares. I had Shabazian winning this fight via first round knockout. I think that he'll be able to get through Brad Tavares. That's a gamble, if there's ever been a gamble. But this is the BMF belt. We got a BMF belt on the line. Anything can happen on this fight card. I went off an of impulse for the vast majority of these. When I go over these notes, everything is screaming in my head, Brad Tavares, because of the experience and the fact that he's going to take this fight beyond the first minute. And Emin Shabazian, I should have written this down. I don't have it written down. I believe I have it written down on my uh, on my uh, little summary here. Emin Shabazian, 10-0 in his mixed martial arts career, 3-0 in the UFC. He defeated Antonio Jones just 40 seconds back at UFC 239. He also shoot off submission, submission skills, defeating Jack Marshman in just a minute and 12 seconds into the first round. In his career, he's got nine first-round finishes, seven of those taking place in under a minute and 12 seconds. Yeah. Seven of those victories take place in under a minute and 12 seconds. I'm always critical of a fighter that has that amount of finishes in just a minute and 12 seconds. However, he's doing this against top-level UFC talent. I shouldn't say quite top level UFC talent, but nonetheless, did it against UFC talent. There's a very big difference between UFC 185 pound prospects and prospects in the California Stream Fighting Championships. Okay, that's there's a big difference there. You went 5-0 in the California, um, California Extreme Fighting Organization. All those victories essentially were under a minute and 12 seconds. Worth noting, um, so that's why I'm extra critical of Emin Shabazian. And the fact that he's got Emin Tarverdian in his quarter makes me extra afraid. What do y'all think? I went, I did this off of impulse. I want to see it happen because this is UFC 244. We have Dwayne The Rock Johnson belting the winner of Jorge Masvidal like against Nate Diaz. Anything can happen in this fight. What do y'all think of this fight? This is the most fun because I can have a live stream because you actually communicate with a million comments spamming in the chat. So what do y'all think? Let's get back to this fight in particular. I agree with that. This is one of the reasons I keep coming back to this channel. Emma Shabazian and Brad Tavares. Do you guys think Emma Shabazian is going to get through Brad Tavares and keep tearing through the division like he has, knocking out people in the first minute? That's what's very interesting about this fight. Um, we got 21-year-old Emma Shabazian, who at this current pace could eventually become... The youngest USC champion in history. My mind tells me Moswell, but Hart Diaz, Edmund, Mr. Head movement sucks. <laughs> yes. Why don't Conor McGregor sell potatoes? Proper spuds. That's a good one right there. So, again, that's another added fight that's um, worth noting the 185 pound weight class. 
Anyway, the next fight is straight number 12 ranked Shane Burgos against the unranked Marquand Americani. Mr. Finland. Let me get this up here. In the 145 pound division, number 12 ranked Shane Burgos against Marquand Americani. Number 12 ranked Shane Burgos. He's from the United States. He's got a record of 12 victories, with one loss. With four knockouts, five submissions, and three decision victories. Marquand Americani is from Finland. He's got a record of 15 victories, with three losses, with one knockout, 10 submissions, and four decision victories. Shane Burgos stands at 5'11 and a 75 and a half inch reach. And Marquand Americani stands at 5'10 and a 72 inch reach. Number 12 ranked Shane Burgos. He's got a record of five victories with one loss in his UFC career with two fight of the night bonuses. We defeated Tygo Trador via unanimous decision. We defeated Godfaro Pepe via unanimous decision. Lost to Calvin Cater via round three TKL. Calvin Cater is one heck of a fighter. Um, then he defeated Kurt Hollabaugh via round one armbar. And then he defeated Cub Swanson in his last fight via split decision back in May of 2019. 1201 in his mixed martial arts career. His only loss was to fellow undefeated fighter Calvin Cater at that time. Shane Burgos, another black belt in Tiger Shulman's mixed martial arts. And he's got five submission victories to his credit, including three naked chokes, a guillotine choke, and an arm bar. In his last fight against Cub Swanson, uh, outstruck him on the feet, 147 to 132. Now, in a very fun fight, I might add, that was a back and forth battle, a very high output fight. <laughs> Rog versus Mark Kerr. I haven't heard Kerr's name in a while. I wonder what he's up to nowadays. Um, Cub Swanson. Or in that fight against Cub Swanson, this is one of the weirdest judges' decisions. I remember watching that fight, and I thought Shane Burgos had that fight in the bag. Um, one judge had it 30-27 for Swanson. Another judge had it 30-27 for Shane Burgos. And one judge had a 29-28 Burgos, eventually leading him to a split decision. One judge was smoking crack in that fight because I thought Shane Burgos won that fight. I'm rooting for Americani, but it's more fun to say. <laughs> His name is more fun to say. Mark one Americani. By the way, in the 145 pound division, a very stacked division, both these fighters are 5 and 1. 5 and 1, Mark one Americani. He defeated Dan Ugle via first round knockout due to flying knee. Then he wanted to defeat uh, Meggio Fuelen via rear naked choke. Then he defeated Mike Wilkinson via end of his decision. Lost to Arnold Allen via split decision. Defeated Jason the Kid Knight via split decision. Defeated Chris Fultz. Fishgold in his last fight back in June 2019 where he won that fight via Anaconda Choke. Get this too. In his night in his 18th fight, mixed martial arts career, this will be the first time he's fighting in the United States. And he's fighting in New York City at Madison Square Garden. So fighting from Finland across Europe, now fighting in the United States. I thought that was relatively interesting. I'm not sure exactly how big of a factor that will be, but it's interesting nonetheless that this is his first fight in his 19, in his 18 fight career. Soon to be 19, 19 fight career that he's fighting in the United States. I thought that was worth noting. Uh, in his last fight against Chris Fishgold, he took Fishgold down. Fishgold tried to turtle into him, and he eventually slapped and immediately slapped on an anaconda, turned it into him like a clock, and it was very interesting to see. He slapped on the anaconda, and they're both on their back. And Chris Fishgold, they kind of rotated together simultaneously like a clock. A lot of people, when they have that anaconda choke on, you try to walk your legs like a clock to try and relieve that pressure. And what the person has it on has to do is follow you around. So you're kind of holding on to that choke like this. And it looks very silly, but it was effective. He got the submission victory. And he trains at SBG out of Ireland alongside some Irish guy. Relative obscure. I'm not sure if you heard his name before. He did, he's known for throwing a dolly out of a bus. At a bus. Oh, well. Some sort of Irish fighter. Um, he's got 10 submission victories in his career, including three Renegade chokes, a triangle, a heel hook, a leg lock, and three Anaconda chokes, as well as a guillotine choke. Three Anaconda chokes. That's one of his go-to submissions. By the way, everyone, The Rock is going to play in a movie as Mark Kerr. Wait, what? The smashing. I saw that, and I thought it was a joke. <laughs> is, is that real? I thought it was a meme. Mark Kerr. I remember him. I remember he won a title. He won, a, he won one of the early tournaments, I remember. He was a former heavyweight wrestler, but I, I, I honestly don't know what happened with him. SBG. Yes, t Your Their comments are right before mine. That's interesting um, that Dwayne The Rock Johnson would do that. 
So, this is another interesting fight. I had this fight going to Shane Burgos via Nam's decision. I don't think Mark Juan Americani is going to be able to submit Shane Burgos. I think Shane Burgos is going to take this fight down to the ground. I think he's got this fight beat on the ground and standing. I could be very wrong as well. All right, Timo, what's up, Sandy? I'm doing very well. Kerr went down to drugs, booze. <laughs> exactly. It's real, bro. Rock literally almost cried two times talking about him. That's nuts. So, and another very interesting fight. And again, if this, if this ESPN two, if this ESPN two prelims was its own Fox card, or excuse me, its own ESPN Plus card, or even an ESPN card, this would be a stack card. I'm telling you. And now, according to the fans out there, out of the 171 that voted, let me refresh this. I wonder if I have any more votes in the meantime. If you guys haven't. If you guys haven't voted on any of my polls, go to the community section on my page. Go to t and MMA. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. And I have a list of polls with a lot of fighters and which one of your fights is your favorite. Um, right now, I'm reading them live. As of right now. And according to you guys. And according to you guys. Um, I'm sorry. According to you guys, I asked you guys, what is your favorite fight on the prelims? Uh, Corey Anderson versus Johnny Rocker. Shane Burgos against Marquand Americani. Brad Tavares against Emma Shabazzi. And Andre Olofsky against Jared Zeno Rosenstruck. 67% of you went with number 7 ranked Corey Anderson against number 11 ranked Cor Johnny Walker. And I want to see if that shocks me, but it really doesn't. This is one heck of a fight that we have in front of us. And so let me get this up here. Johnny Walker against number seven ranked Corey Anderson. 67% of you think that this is gonna be this is your fight that you're most looking forward to on the fight on the ESPN2 prelims. Number seven ranked Corey Anderson. He's from the United States. He's got a record of 12 inches, four losses, with four knockouts, zero submissions, and eight decision victories. He's taking on number eleven ranked Johnny Walker. He's from Brazil. He's got a record of 17 victories with three losses with 14 knockouts, two submissions, and one decision victory. Number seven ranked Corey Anderson. He's got a record of nine and four in his UFC career with a knockout loss against Jimmy Manoa um, back in March 2017. Knockout loss against Open St. Pru back in 2007 or back at UFC 217 at Madison Square Garden. Then he went on to defeat Patrick Cummins via an decision. Went on to defeat Glover Teixeira via an decision. And his last fight defeated Alir Latifi via an decision back in December of 2018. He was the Ultimate Fighter season 19 winner. He's a former NCAA Division III All American at Lincoln College in Illinois. He landed 52 takedowns in his 13 fight UFC career at a 56 at a 50% success rate. And he also outstrikes his opponent 4.37 to 2.2 per minute. And he also lands five takedowns per 15 minutes as well. He's a pro bum Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and has a whopping 83% takedown defense takedown defense percentage. I don't think Johnny Walker's ever gonna try to take down Corey Anderson. Classic striker versus grappler matchup, but this is the BMF belt. This is the BMF card in all reality. I got this fight going to Johnny Walker via first round knockout. Johnny Walker's gone three and zero in this UFC career, defeating Khalil Roundtree via one minute and fifty seven second knockout in, in his UFC de debut. Defeated Justin Ledet via fifteen second TKO and defeated Misha Surkinov in just thirty six seconds back in March two thousand and nineteen. Went on to dislocate his shoulder in the celebration. Johnny Walker, you never, you never stop amusing me. I think would I think Walker will win in a three round decision. Really, uh, you know, if there's one fight, man, I just don't see that. That's interesting, and I can definitely see it happen. I don't see that happening. I, I love you, Sean Rob to death, but that's one that I don't see happening. If Johnny Walker's going to win this fight, I don't think it's going to be a three round decision. I think it's going to be a knockout in the first round. I think it's going to have to be because I believe Corey Anderson is going to try to take this fight down to the ground. Let's see Johnny Walker's takedown defense. Now he has done relatively well as of yet keeping the fight standing. But let's talk about Johnny Walker a little bit. He's on a nine-fight winning streak, eight of those being finishes. He's got 14 first-round finishes, eight of those in under one minute. He's former UC MMA champion, or 205-pound champion out of England, and the former EDB Challenge 205-pound um, champion in Belgium. Um, he has not lost since 2016. He has landed 13. Okay, get this. In his three fights in the UFC, has only landed 13 significant strikes, 23% of those resulted in a knockdown. 13 significant strikes for Johnny Walker. He's knocked out three people. <laughs> That's how crazy this dude is. 
Um, his elbows from the clinch. Powerful knockout against Khalil Roundtree. And he also had a spinning back fist against Justin Ledette. And after after a missed kick, he missed a kick and went on to knock knock out Misha Serkinov via flying knee. And Misha Serkinov wasn't even bending down. It wasn't like he was going in for a takedown. Johnny Walker timed it perfectly. Johnny Walker is so athletic at six foot six and it has an 82 inch reach. Six foot six is able to jump up in the air and knee Misha Serkinov from a classic standing Muay Thai stance. You know, he's got that lead leg forward, classic standing. And Johnny Walker, basketball player type athletic abilities, is able to jump up in the air and knee that little head target. That's nuts. Shows how dangerous Johnny Walker is on the feet. So, conventional wisdom and the logical T Bone MMA says. Uh, Corey Anderson wins via unanimous decision. Now nah, this is the BMF belt. <laughs> this is the B- we got a BMF belt. This is the BMF card. Um, I got Johnny Walker winning this fight and also winning a performance of the night bonus. If you guys are wondering what the little triangles in the corner, the triangle in the upper right hand corner, like Hakeem Dawadu, that's what I have picked for fight of the night. Performance of the night, I have going to Johnny Walker. I got two picks for performance of the night: Derek Lewis and Johnny Walker, both via knockout. So. 67% of you choose this fight to be your favorite fight on the undercard. 20% of you also said, I don't care about any of the undercard fights. I only care about Masvidal versus Diaz, which is fair. The BMF belt looks sick. Yes, I actually enjoyed it. I enjoyed the BMF belt a lot. Imagine telling people you're an MMA fighter and 23% of your, 23% of your significant strikes knock people down. <laughs> that's nuts. And that's what Johnny Walker, one of the weirdest statistics I've ever seen. Kevin Lee could be cringy as Ben Askren, but he just isn't intelligent. <laughs> Looks better than the normal belt. I completely agree, and it doesn't shock me. You know how I pictured that belt going? I'm, I pictured it being like the old UFC belts, like for the tournament days or even the super fight. I thought it was going to be like the guy with the belt. You know what I'm saying? Like the guy standing on top of the world. I thought it was going to be one of those, but no, this is like a legitimate professional belt. I wasn't expecting that. I thought it was going to be a goof. That was $50,000. That actually doesn't shock me. That's actually, to think that the McGregor versus Mayweather belt was, I think, the hundreds of thousands of dollars, doesn't surprise me that that was $50,000. What's up, Pete? He just needs ring IQ once that he was. <laughs> once he has that, watch out. Speaking of Kevin Lee against Gregor Gillespie, let's move on to that next fight. And this fight, we finally move on to the main card of UFC 244, one of the most stacked main cards that we have. And let's take a closer look. I also had another poll. T1 MMA loved the polls today, or this week. And I asked you all, what was your favorite fight, aside from the main event? Because I know everybody's gonna pick the main event. I will too, I'm not gonna lie. But I asked you guys, aside of the main event, aside from the main event, it was a typo in my, um, Typo in my little uh, comment there. Let me get you all up here. Aside from the main event, which fight on the main card are you most excited for? 7% of you said Kevin Lee against Gregor Gillespin. 5% of you picked Derek Lewis against Blake Ivanov. 9% of you chose Stephen Waterboy Thompson against Vicente Luque. 63% of you chose Kelvin Gastelum and uh, Darren Till. And 8% of you said, seriously, I only care about Diaz versus Masvidal. Again, fair, but that's not what I was trying to judge. I wanted honest answers, and that's what I got. So 63% of you chose Darren Till against Kelvin Gastelum, and 7% of you choose Kevin Lee against Gregor Gillespie. That's fair. That's one heck, and this is going to be a tough one. If I had it ranked for you guys, um, if I chose you guys to rank it, it's going to be very difficult for you guys because these fights are stacked. Uh, The top five fights on this card are just absolutely nuts. All right, so let's begin this main card. And before I do that, I will let you all, I'm going to take a short break here for a second. So I will have Bruce Buffer take it away here. I'm going to deal with that Bruce Buffer intro. I'm going to take a little bit of a break and I will be right back for the main card. So here's Bruce Buffer to kick off the main card. And now, presenting the champion, fighting 
out of the red corner. This man is a podcaster. He stands six feet two inches tall, weighing in at 185 pounds. Podcasting out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, presenting the host of T-Bone MMA Podcast, Tyler T-Bone Brack. All right, thank you very much, Bruce Buffer. So let's get back into it. The main card of UFC 244. We start off in the 155-pound division, where we got number 10 ranked Kevin Lee takes on number 11 ranked Gregor Gillespie. And a very important fight for the longevity of both of these fighters' careers, both for very different reasons. We got Kevin Lee, who's looking just to maintain his spot at the top of the 155-pound division. And we got Gregor Gillespie on the completely opposite end, but fighting for very similar reasons. He's looking to break into the top 10 of the UFC scene, eventually get to the top of the division and at 13-0 and 0 in an NCAA Division I All-American, four-time Division I All-American and a one-time Division I National Champion wrestler. Gregor Gillespie has got a lot to offer the 155-pound division, so let's get started. Number 10 right, Kevin Lee. He's from the United States. He's got a record of 17 victories with five losses with two knockouts, eight submissions, and seven decision victories. He's taking on number 11 right, Gregor Gillespie. He's from the United States, actually from upstate New York. Um, he's got a record of 13 victories with zero losses in his mixed martial arts career with set, six knockouts, five submissions, and only two decision victories. Kevin Lee stands at 5'10", has a 77-inch reach. Greg Gillespie stands at 5'7", has a 71-inch reach. Six-inch reach advantage going in favor of Kevin Lee. However, that's the majority of the fights for Kevin Lee. I haven't really seen him use his reach advantage effectively as of yet in his mixed martial arts career. Definitely uses it in the wrestling department, but in terms of striking, I just haven't seen it utilized as well. So he's got that there. However, it's interesting nonetheless. I just noticed that you're choosing all of my picks. You aren't going to pull a Pete on me, are you? No, no, I will never be Pete ever. Never be a Pete. Anyway, number 10 right, Kevin Lee. He's got a record of... Number 10 ranked Kevin Lee. He's got a record of 10 victories to 5 losses in his UFC career. He started his UFC career in 9-2. And, and then in his last, I'm going to go over his last couple of fights. He defeated Michael Chiesa via round 1 Rian Nikachuk before losing to Tony Ferguson via round 3 triangle to lose his shot at the 155 pound, the interim 155 pound championship, which is completely dissolved into thin air for some reason. Dissolved? Whatever. I don't think that's the right word, but whatever. It's disappeared into thin air. I don't know what happened to that 155-pound interim championship. And then he wanted to defeat Edson Barboza via fifth-round TKO. It was actually due to a cut that Edson Barboza had. And it shows the chin of Kevin Lee because he ate a spinning wheel kick from Edson Barboza that would put 99.99999% of the human population to sleep. And he did his best chicken dance, and he was able to survive and eventually get a fifth-round TKO victory. Did you see that huge boil on Kevin's chest? I did not. I did not see that. I really hope he did the chicken dance exactly. Um, Kevin Lee, this is his first fight after a recent move in July to try to start a gym against um, where he's being trained under Faraz Zahabi now. So that's definitely going to be the most interesting factor going in this fight. The fact that he did make the 155 pound weight limit. The fact that he actually might have staff, according to you guys. I did not see that. Um, but. The real important story here is the fact that he did make 155 pounds. That was the big hurdle for him, in my opinion, was making that weight class and to make it healthy. I believe that he is healthy, and the fact that he is training under Peraz Zahabi now, that's the other huge story. And that's the other big X factor going into this fight. How much will that play a factor into this fight? He's a former NCAA Division II wrestler, and he was actually a national tournament qualifier and went 37-0 and at Grand Valley State University as a sophomore. However, he dropped out to pursue mixed martial arts. So that's very interesting. Um, he dropped out after a sophomore year to prefer pursue mixed martial arts. That's very interesting. And it makes me wonder exactly if he had stayed committed to wrestling, exactly how, how many more accolades would he be able to attain as a wrestler, as an NCAA wrestler, NCAA Division II wrestler. He went 37-0. and and I wasn't exactly sure how he placed in the national tournament. I think he actually fell out a little bit early. But 37-0 and 0 in the regular season is no mean. It's not easy to do for sure. Um, and I just wonder, he dropped out two years into his wrestling career at um, Grand Valley State University. I just wonder exactly what would happen with him. And by the way, he didn't start wrestling until he was a junior in high school. 
and eventually went on to have a very good wrestling career. And eventually dropped out to pursue mixed martial arts. He lands 4.06 significant strikes and only absorbs 3.18. He's 32 of 80 takedowns in his UFC career. 32 and 15 fights. Um, 44% success rate. He's got an 81% takedown defense rate. Um, however, in his fight, by the way, the 80 takedowns, the vast majority of those that were defended was against RDA. He kind of burned himself out against uh, RDA. And get this, he was outstruck on the ground 40 to 2 against RDA. He was focused on more about getting the fight down to the ground rather than actually keeping him down and landing significant strikes. And he was actually taken down many times in that fight. He landed 12 takedowns out of 32 attempts. He was actually taken down eight times against Rafael Dos Santos. It's one of the most bizarre performances that I've ever seen from Kevin Lee. And it shows how good RDA is all over the all in all aspects of the fight game. Him being able to take down Kevin Lee and being able to defend the vast majority of the takedowns. I'd wrestle the GOAT, 50K or not, staff or not. Uh, Kevin Lee. So he lands 53% of his fight. He lands 53 of his strikes standing, 10% in the clinch, and 37% on the ground. So he's not necessarily a lay and pray type of fighter. He's got also got eight submission victories in his career, and that's the big X factor in this fight. He's got five rear naked chokes, a guillotine, an armbar, and a standing and guillotine choke. Um, in that fight against Edson Barboza, by the way, he missed weight by a pound. He was able to make weight in this fight. I think that was one of the bigger hurdles that he had to, had to overcome. And the fact that he's been training under Faraz Ahabi now is going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. I've had staff. I know what it looks like. It doesn't take a doctor to look. I've never had staff before, so I'm not 100% sure. You can't even do. <laughs> oh, y'all are still going with that staff thing. I can't confirm it or deny it. I have no idea. But the fact that it got past the New York Athletic Commission would not shock me at all. The New York Athletic Commission is horrible. <laughs> just horrible gotta love the new york athletic commission but anyway he's taking on number 11 ranked gregor gillespie he's got a record of six victories with zero losses in his ufc career where he defeated glacio franca via an decision back in september 2016 in his ufc debut defeated andrew holbrook via 21 second knockout defeated jason gonzalez via round two arm triangle defeated Jor jordan rinaldi via round one knockout defeated vince mitchell via round two arm triangle choke Defeated Yancey Medeiros in his last fight via round two TKL back in January of this year. He's got a 7 minute and 44 second average fight time. He's a former Ring of Combat, which is out in New Jersey, upstate, upper northeast area, um, specifically in New Jersey. Ring, former Ring of Combat, 155 pound champion, which he defended that belt two times. He was a former NCAA Division I wrestler, four time Division I All American, and he won as a high schooler the he won uh, as a high schooler the New York State Championship two times. That's very impressive, New York. High school wrestling is one of the best in the country. Um, and his first, and he was actually competed as a true freshman. And he was the first true um, freshman All American for his college, Ebenar, um, Eben, Eben, for his college. He was the first uh, NCAA Division I All American. And he had 152 total wins in his uh, in his uh, college wrestling career. 40 of those was as a freshman. He had a .917 winning percentage. Four-time Division One National Tournament qualifier, and he won the Division One National Championship in 2007. He's also got five submission victories, four of those being arm triangle choke. If you guys didn't know, I like the arm triangle choke. If you guys didn't see it, um, and he's also got a rear naked choke victory. He's landed 17 of 47 takedowns in his UFC career. I believe that's a 50, 49 percent. That's not right. It's a relatively low percent, to be honest. It's below 50 percent. 17 of 47 takedowns in his UFC career. 7.44 takedowns per 15 minutes. So he's always actively looking for a takedown. Even though he's very comfortable on the feet as well, he lands 62% of his strikes on the ground, 3.6 and 1.81. He outstrikes his opponent per minute. I got Gregor Gillespie in that fight. He is probably one of the most complete wrestlers that we have in mixed martial arts at the moment. The next big argument was, that in terms of pure wrestlers, there's not a lot a mixed martial artist that have an NCAA Division I national championship. That is the pinnacle of wrestling, aside from the Olympics. And the only person in the UFC, on the, off the top of my head, that has a gold medal in Olympics, the 125, 135-pound champion, the double champ, um, he calls himself Triple C. Triple C. 
I, I know he's not relatively obscure, but it's a guy named Henry Cejudo. I'm not sure if you heard of him before. And he's also the intergender champion as well. If we actually showered, he wouldn't have staff. Yikes. <laughs> so what do y'all think? Rigor Gillespie or Kevin Lee? And I asked you guys what you thought of that fight, and I actually have... I should have it anyway. First fight. I took a random I took a poll of y'all. Let me get that up here. I took a poll out of 97% of the votes. This is the closest one that I have. We got Greg Gillespie. 53% of you picked Greg Gillespie and only 47% picked Kevin Lee. At one point, I had 96 votes or I think it was 92 votes at the time and it was dead even. So this is one of those fights. That's one of the tougher fights to call for you guys. In my opinion, this fight's going to the ground. Straight up. This fight's going to the ground. The better wrestler is Gregor Gillespie. I pick a third round arm triangle victory very similar to Rafael De Sancho's. That's what I got in this fight. And the fact that Kevin Lee is dropping down a weight class again at 155 pounds, I'm not sure exactly. He's very conditioned. I'm not taking anything away from that. But when he struggled to get that fight down to the ground against Rafael De Sancho's, you saw a little bit of what happens when he doesn't get the fight down on the ground. He's vulnerable um, when he's tired. It's a three-round fight. That's the big X factor in this fight. It's a three-round fight. And I think with, with his recent camp move to, um, to try to start jam training under Faraz Hobby, I think that he will try to keep this fight standing in all reality and try to utilize that six-inch reach advantage that he has. Training with Faraz Hobby. I think they're going to try to move away from the wrestling game in this fight. Try to keep the fight standing. He's got enough wrestling skills. He's got 81% takedown defense rate. Um, and that's in 15 fights in the UFC. I think he's going to have the wherewithal to keep the fight standing and try to effectively use the six-inch reach. Even though he hasn't really done that in his mixed martial arts career as of yet, this is also his first time fighting with Faraz Hobby in his corner. I think we're going to see a different type of Kevin Lee. And it's going to be very interesting to see nonetheless. That is the first fight on the... UFC 244 main card. The next fight is one of the most exciting fights on this card. Excuse me. We got number five ranked Derek Lewis against number eight ranked Blago Ivanov. Derek Lewis is from the United States. He's got a record of 21 victories with seven losses with 18 knockouts, one submission, and two decision victories. Number eight ranked Blago Ivanov is from Bulgaria. He's got a record of 18 victories with two losses with six knockouts, six submissions, and six decision victories. Derek the Black Beast Lewis stands at 6 foot 3 and has a 79 inch reach. Blagoy Ivanov stands at 5 foot 11 and has a 73 inch reach. Blagoy Ivanov, he's got, he got a record of two victories with one loss in his UFC career. He lost to Junior DeSantos via five, round five unanimous decision back in July of 2018 in his UFC debut. That's one tough fight in your UFC debut. Then he defeated Ben Rothbell via unanimous decision back in March 2019. Then he went on to defeat Ty Duivasa back in June 2019 via unanimous decision in his last fight. He also went 6 1 in his Bellator career, losing to Alexander Volkanov. Volkov, the round two ran a choke in the Bellator's heavyweight tournament, which took place back in 2014. That was his only loss at Bellator. He went 4 0 in the World Series of Fighting, was the former World Series of Fighting heavyweight champion, which he defended that belt three times. He was also the former PFL heavyweight champion. He's a 2000, 2008 World Combat Sambo champion at St. Petersburg, Russia. He's also an international master of sport in combat sambo, and is also a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Black, black belt in Judo, excuse me, a black belt in Judo. Um, with six submission victories in his career, two were naked chokes, three guillotines, one of those of which were standing, and an Americana. You want to talk about BMFs on this card? Blake Roy even off a stab in the heart. I'm not kidding. Like, literally, you stab, he's got a hole in his chest right here. He was stabbed in the chest and survived and was put into a medically induced coma. Six months after that, he fought and won four straight. <laughs> And his, he only lost to Bla he only he only he went on that four fight winning streak and only went on to lose against Alexander Volkov. Only lost to two people in his mixed martial arts career: one to Alexander Volkov and one to Junior Dos Santos. Never been finished in his mixed martial arts career out of twenty fights. Um, he was outstruck by Junior Dos Santos, two hundred and twenty to one hundred and two. However, in his last fight, outstruck Ben Rothwell. And excuse me, the fight after that outstruck Ben Rothwell, one hundred forty six, one hundred forty. And he landed two takedowns against Tai Tuivasa, outstriking him 81 to 66. And also, he had one knockdown in that fight, leading him to a very secure um, unanimous decision victory. <laughs> so,
So, uh, Blingo Ivanov, a lot of people think that he's going to try to take this fight down to the ground. Rightfully so. He's a world he's a world champion in combat sambo, in an Ash Master of Sport, and a black belt in judo. However, he seems perfectly content with standing some with some fighters in the UFC, that being tied to Ivasa, Ben Rothwell, and Junior Dos Santos. He's facing, facing off against number five ranked Derek the Black Beast Lewis. He's got a record of 12 victories with five losses in his UFC career. Where, by the way, if you'll have to look at his record, but I'm going to go off his record after his loss against Mark Hunt. He went on to defeat Marcin Tiberia via round three TKO. Then he went on to defeat Francis Ngannou via unanimous decision. That fight never happened. Let's just forget that fight ever happened. But he did win that fight. But let's be fair, all of us lost. Um, then he went on to defeat Alexander Volkov via round three knockout. One of the best comeback knockouts ever. And then he went on to lose his championship fight against uh, Daniel Cormier via round two Renek Joke. And in his last fight, lost to Junior Santos via round two TKO back in March of 2019. He was the former Legacy Fighting Championships heavyweight champion. Was 9-1 in his last 10 fights prior to his UFC championship fight against Daniel Cormier. He was one of those fighters that just kind of slipped through the cracks and were like, oh my goodness, Derek Lewis is fighting for a title. Derek Lewis was one fight away from being the baddest person on earth. Let's just make that very clear. I love Derek Lewis so much, and I have him winning via round three knockout, earning himself a performance in the night bonus. It's a bold prediction right there because the Blago Ivanov is a very tough fighter. However, I'm somewhat confident in that pick. I think Derek Lewis will win this fight. Third round knockout, stretching it a little bit, but I do think that he'll win this fight. Um, he's a 2018 comeback fighter of the year. Pulled out. Um, by the way, during hurricane, during the hurricane that hit um, Houston, Texas a while back, he claimed to have pulled at least 100 people away from his home with his lifted truck, away from their homes with his lifted truck. He's got a 53% takedown defense rate, 2.69 significant strikes landed per minute compared to an absorbed 2.38, 0.47 knockdowns per 15 minutes. He's got three performance of the night bonuses and three fire of the night bonuses. Derek, my balls was hot. Lewis. Let's see what y'all had to think about Derek Lewis, the chances that Derek Lewis had in this fight. Out of the 125 people that voted, 60% of you chose Derek the Black Beast Lewis over Blagoy Ivanov in the 200 in the 100 in the 200 in the heavyweight cha- in the heavyweight fight um, on the UFC 244 main card. So I actually find that somewhat surprising. I believe Blago Ivanov is even a slight betting favorite, if I'm not mistaken. But it's Derek Lewis that pulls out on the T1 MMA polls out of the 125 people that voted. 60% of y'all decided that Derek Lewis is going to defeat um, Blago Ivanov. All right, the next fight is in the 170-pound division. And it is a very interesting one. We got number nine ranked Stephen Wonderboy Thompson against number 14 ranked Vicente Luque. Uh, number 14 ranked Stephen Wonderboy Thompson is from the United States. He's got a record of 14 victories with four losses with seven knockouts, one submission, and six decision victories. Number 14 ranked Vicente Luque is from the United States. He's got a record of 17 victories with six losses with nine knockouts, six submissions, and two decision victories. Number nine ranked Stephen Wonderboy Thompson stands at six, six foot flat and has a 75 inch reach. And Vicente Luque stands at five foot 11 and has a 75 and a half inch reach. Let's start with number 14, Ray Vicente Luque. He's got a record of 10 bitches with two losses in his UFC career. Since his le- most recent loss to Leon Edwards via name's decision, he went on to defeat Nico the Hybrid Price via Darce Joke in the second round. Then he defeated Chad LaPriest via round one knockout. Defeated Jalen Turner via round one knockout. Defeated Brian Barbarino via round three knockout. Defeated Derek Kranz via round one knockout. And he also defeated Mike Perry via round three split decision where he nearly set, he broke, Mike Perry's nose, to put it very simply. <laughs> He's a brown belt in jiu-jitsu as well with six submission victories, including one guillotine, four darts chokes, and an anaconda. He defeated Tiago Santos way back in 2012 via round one knockout. Yes, Tiago Santos, the 205-pound contender that nearly beat John Jones on one leg. Yes, uh, via round one knockout. Then he lost to Hader Hassan. Uh, via round three and a half decision in Ultimate Fighter Season 21. He dropped Nico Price and immediately went for the darts and... Let me tell you something. It's the amount of power that he's able to generate in such a short distance that makes Vincente Luque so dangerous. It's the short strikes that he has. Um, he's also got great ground and pound. When he knocks people down, he goes for the finish, and he's able to get it at such a high success rate. A lot of people knock people down. A lot of people knock their opponents down, but they're not necessarily able to finish the fight. 
He's one of those guys. Once he has you hurt, his ground pound is so powerful. He can finish you on the ground. Um, and get this. He knocks people out who don't normally get knocked out. He knocked out Bilal Muhammad. He's only been knocked out one time in his career. He submitted Nico the Hyper Price. He's only been submitted one time in his career and also dropped him previously to that. And he's only been knocked out twice in his career, just, um, Nico Price has. He knocked out Chad LaPriest, and that was the second time he's ever been knocked out. He knocked out Brian Barberina, and that was the first time Brian Barberina's ever been knocked out. He's got 1.1 knock, knockdown percentage in his uh, mixed martial art, in his UFC career. So that's 1.11 knockdowns every 15 minutes. He lands 5.19 significant strikes per minute and only absorbs 4.72. He's got a seven minute, and five, seven minute and 52 second average fight time in his UFC career. He's taking on number nine ranked Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. He's got a record of nine victories, four losses, and one draw in his UFC career where he defeated Johnny Hendricks via round one knockout. Um, defeated Rory McDonald via an amp decision. Had a draw against Tyron Woodley um, in his 205 pound championship run at UFC 205 at Madison Square Garden. Went on to rematch, had a majority decision, lost against Tyron Woodley in one of the worst fights of all time. Had a unanimous decision victory over Jorge Masvidal. Lost to Darren Till via unanimous decision, albeit a very close fight. And then got knocked out against Anthony Pettis in the second round. Back in March 2019, in a fight that he was relatively dominating in and then just got cracked by Anthony Pettis. And the world was never the same since. I just never pictured that ever happening. And Stephen Thompson was knocked out for the first time in his career. Anthony Pettis is a former 155-pounder. And was a former 155 pound champion at one point. And Stephen Thompson was able to absorb the hardest strikes from Tyron Woodley multiple times in his career and multiple times in a fight. And that just shows the kind of power that Anthony Pettis possesses in his hands. Um, he was able to knock Stephen Wonderboy Thompson out cold. That was a shocking knockout. He's got 1 3 and 1 in his last five fights. He's got a 58 and 0 kickboxing, um, kickboxing, professional kickboxing record 58 and 0. Get this, too. That was the first time Stephen Wonderboy Thompson has ever been knocked out in not just his mixed martial arts career, but take that to international sport karate. Take that back to his 58-fight kickboxing, kickboxing career. Never been knocked out. That was the first time he'd ever been knocked out in his career in any combat sports. It's nuts. Um, he was the former IKF, International Kickboxing Federation, world champion, and former International Sport Karate Association, world champion, and multiple-time national champion as well. He's a fifth-degree black belt in Kempo Karate, a first-degree black belt in traditional Japanese Jiu-Jitsu. He's also a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with uh, only submission victory uh, via rear naked choke back in uh, 2010. He lands 3.52 significant strikes per minute and only absorbs 2.54, 0.7 knockdowns per 15 minutes, 78% takedown defense rate, 13 minutes and 44 seconds of average fight time. 88% of his strikes are standing. 63% to the head. 25% to the body. And 12% to the head. I got Stephen Wonder Boy Thompson winning this fight. Be around three and a half decision. Not only because he looks like me. And I don't want to see a guy that looks like me get his face blown off by Vincente Luque. But the fact that Vincente Luque generates his power through short strikes. That's what he looks for. He looks to take the fight. He looks to take the fight and bring, bring the pressure. And Stephen Wonderboy Thompson is an expert at maintaining the distance. So as long as Vicente Luque doesn't catch him with a very long strike like Anthony Pettis did, I think Stephen Wonderboy Thompson is going to be able to stay on the outside, land his strikes, pick his strikes appropriately, and eventually get a finish in. Get a finish in the... Or, if, excuse me, getting a name decision victory later on in the fight. Moving on to the co-main event of the evening. We got number four ranked Kelvin Gastelum. Oh, and by the way, when I had asked you guys, what was your favorite fight on the main card, aside from the main event itself, 63% of you out of the 136 that voted, 63% went with Kelvin Gastelum and Darren Till in the co-main event in the 185-pound division. No doubt about it. A very interesting fight, nonetheless. We got... Number four, Kelvin Gaslam. He's from the United States. He's got a record of 15 victories, the four losses, and one no contest with six knockouts, four submissions, and five decision victories. He's taking on number 10 ranked Darren Till. Number 10 ranked in the welterweight division, Darren Till. He's got a record of 17 victories with two losses with 10 knockouts, two submissions, and five decision victories in his mixed martial arts career. Kelvin Gaslam stands at 5'9", has a 71 and a half inch reach, and Darren Till stands at 6 foot flat and has a 74 and a half inch reach. Let's start off with number 10 welterweight contender, Darren Till. He's got a record of five victories with two 
two losses and one draw in his UFC career. We defeated Wendell Oliveira via round two knockout. He had a draw against Nicholas Dalby. Defeated uh, Jesse Aria via unanimous decision. Defeated Boan uh, Velkovich via unanimous decision. Then he went on to defeat Don Cerrone via round one knockout. Then he went on to defeat Stephen Wonderboy Thompson via round five unanimous decision. And then lost to Tyron Woodley via round two Darce Choke in his failed bid of the 170 pound championship. And then he lost to Jorge Masvidal via round two knockout in his last fight back in March 2019. You want to talk about BMF? You want to talk about BMF fighters as, again? Darren Till was stabbed twice in the back back in 2012. I just thought we'd throw that out there as well. He's a purple belt in Lucha Levera, uh with two submission victories, including a toe hold and an inverted triangle. So don't sleep on his ground game either. He began training at 12 years old, turned pro at 15 years old in kickboxing, transitioned over to MMA at 17 years old, moved to Brazil at 19 years old, stayed there for three years, and eventually went 9-0 with 185 pounds in Brazil, missed weight two times at 170 um, in his career. Or excuse me, missed two missed two, missed weight two times in his 170 pound career, weighing at 176 pounds, 174 pounds, and nine to zero at 185 in his in in Brazil. He's undefeated at 185 pounds. That's definitely something that should be noted. He's also got ten knockouts, five of which are in the first round, two of which are in the second round, zero in the third round. I might add as well. He lands 46 percent of his significant. He's got a 46 percent striking accuracy, and he's actually. Outstruck, he lands 2.41 significant strikes per minute and absorbs 3.09. And he's got an 83.83% takedown defense rate. He's got one performance of the night bonus and two fight of the night bonuses. He's taking on number four ranked Kelvin Gastelum. He's got a record of three victories, or excuse me, of uh, 10 victories, the four losses, and one no contest in his UFC career. And since his move up to 185 pounds, he defeated Tim Kennedy via round three TKO, and he had a no contest against Vitor Belfort. Originally a TKO victory in the second round, but eventually got it overturned due to. Welcome the good stuff. Anyway, he had a loss against Chris Wyman via round three arm triangle choke and nearly finished that fight, I might add. Then he defeated Michael Bisping via round one knockout. The former champion, Michael Bisping via round one knockout. Then he went on to defeat Jacare Souza via split decision back in May of 2018. And then lost a potential fight of the year candidate against Israel Adesanya via round five unanimous decision. That was one of my favorite fights of 2019. Uh, he's got three two. Uh, he's got he's got three victories, two losses, and one no contest. One hundred eighty five pounds. He's the winner of the Ultimate Fighter season seventeen. Won four straight in the house and eventually defeated Raya Halt in the finale. Um, he's a black belt in tenth plan of jiu jitsu. So don't sleep on his submission game as well. He's got three renegade chokes and a kimura, as well as having two renegade chokes on the Ultimate Fighter. However, we have not seen his submission game since two thousand and fourteen, where he submitted Jake Ellenberger uh, back in two thousand and fourteen. He lands 3.86 significant strikes per minute and absorbs 2.87 significant strikes. Lands nine, landed nine of 18 takedowns. I don't think he's going to go for any takedowns in this fight. Nine takedowns landed in his 15 fight career in the UFC. Also, something that should be noted as well. He's also a southpaw fighter as well, so that's something that should be noted. He stumbled Israel Adesanya with long strikes with his long right hand in the very first round, and he can switch stances very well. In fact, he was in the southpaw stance, switched to orthodox. Switched back to south. Switched back to southpaw. Was able to cover so much distance and covering, um, cover so much distance that eventually clipped Israel Adesanya early on in that first round. Um, and then liver strikes are going to be a big factor in this fight. I think after that fight against Israel Adesanya, it was definitely open there. But that southpaw stance that he has, he loves to go for those liver strikes. I think he's going to. I think he will try to attack the body a little bit in this fight. It's something interesting. It was dropped in the second round, had his first takedown in that fight against Israel Adesanya since 2015, and he took down Israel Adesanya, and that is relatively impressive. Israel Adesanya is one of the toughest guys in the UFC to take down, in the 185-pound division to take down. Take that with a grain of salt because he hasn't fought too many wrestlers. Um, but if you look at his takedown offense, it's actually very high. It's in the high 80s. And the fact that Kelvin Gastelum had his first takedown in almost four years against Israel Adesanya Still shows that Kelvin Gassum has that in his back pocket as well. And the fact that he's a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu under, under Eddie Bravo, 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu, I'm always speaking very highly of that. Um, that pressure. The pressure that he puts on fighters is very interesting. And the pressure that he'll put on Darren Till is what I think will win him this fight via second round knockout. That's what Jorge, Mas or that's what Jorge Masvidal kind of exposed with Darren Till. He put on the pressure and eventually clipped Darren Till and got the finish. I see Kelvin Gassam doing very similar. Um, however, Darren Till moving up a weight class. He's undefeated at 185 pounds. 
I'm usually critical of fighters jumping up a weight class, but hey, it worked out for Danny Cormier. And Danny Cormier was undefeated at heavyweight before fate, before jumping up a weight class in the UFC career and eventually went on to win the title and defend it. Can Darren Till revive his career? Because he's kind of struggling a little bit in his last two fights. The third straight loss after jumping up a weight class is going to be very difficult to come back from despite all the impressive performance that he had prior to his um, two-fight losing streak. If he loses this fight, it's really going to set him back. However, he's got so much to gain from this fight as well. If he's able to get past Kelvin Gaslam, he's right up there in the top five of the 185-pound division. All of a sudden, he becomes a threat for the title eventually. And I think if Kelvin Gaslam gets past Darren Till, he remains the top five of the division, no doubt about it, and eventually will get one more fight to the top of the weight class. However, I don't see Kelvin Gaslam getting a rematch, rematch against Israel Adesanya anytime soon. Again, that being said, if Kelvin Gaslam knocks out Darren Till in just four seconds, and breaks the record. I don't think that'll ever happen. But if he, uh, all I'm trying to say is uh, that was a bit of an exaggeration. But all I gotta say is, if Kelvin Gaston is able to get past Darren Till and get past him very impressively, and leaves all of us begging for him to face off against Israel Adesanya again, it's a possibility. But however, a victory for uh, Kelvin Gaston here, I don't believe will be enough for him to get to Israel Adesanya's next fight. All right. It is finally time for the main event of the evening. We got number three ranked Jorge Mazda against number seven ranked Nate Diaz for the 170 pound BMF belt. What a weird world that we what a weird world that we live in. And I'm not gonna dial, I'm not gonna dive too deep into the utter chaos that is the BMF belt. I got all my money, $100 on Edmund Shabazian via TKO. That's gambling, man. Uh, that's one fight that I'm like, I'm going with it. Because my heart wants to see it so bad, but I wish you the best of luck. Number three ranked Jorge Masvidal, I guess number seven ranked Nate Diaz. I'm not even sure if the rankings matter here because they are fighting for the 170 pound BMF belt. What a weird world that we live in. I think The Rock's gonna get booed. You think so? Because everybody was cheering him. Everybody was cheering him at the weigh-ins. Um, number three ranked Jorge Masvidal, the Florida gangster. He's got a record of 34 victories with 13 losses in his mixed martial arts career with 15 knockouts, two submissions, and 17 decision victories. Um, and number seven ranked Nate Diaz, a West Coast gangsta. He's got a record of 20 victories with 11 losses with four knockouts, 12 submissions, and four decision victories. Um, Jorge Masvidal stands at 5'11", has a 74-inch reach, and Nate Diaz stands at 6'1", has a 76-inch reach. Number seven ranked Nate Diaz. He's got a record of 15 victories with nine losses in his UFC career. Again, I'm not going to go through his entirety of his record right now, but however, I will take his record from his unanimous decision loss against Benson Henderson when he lost the 155-pound championship uh, fight against Benson Henderson via unanimous decision. Then he lost to Josh Thompson via round two TKL. Then he defeated Gray Maynard via, I believe, TKL. Um, then he had lost against Rafael Dos Santos, and then he defeated Michael Johnson via unanimous decision. Then went on to defeat Conor McGregor via round two, where he choke. Then had a majority decision loss against Conor McGregor in their rematch. Then he went on to defeat Anthony Pettis back in August 2019 in his return after almost over three years, almost exactly three years off. Went on to defeat Anthony Pettis in one of his most impressive performances in his career. And Anthony Diaz took out... Didn't really took, take out Anthony Pettis, but that would have been a five-round fight. I think we can all guarantee that Nate Diaz would have finished that fight. Anthony Pettis just got done knocking out Steven Wonderboy Thompson, okay? And Nate Diaz went out there and just starched him. He's got eight fight in the night bonuses, one knock in the night bonus, five submission in the night bonuses, and one performance in the night bonus. He's a second-degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu with 12 submission victories, including four triangles in Americana, four guillotines, an armbar, a rear choke, and one submission due to injury. He lost to Hermes Franca for the WEC 155-pound championship, and then he defeated Man Manvel Gambiran via shoulder injury, to win himself the Ultimate Fighter Season 5. He went 4-3 at 170 pounds, defeating um, Rory Markham via TKO, defeated Marcus Davis via guillotine choke, lost to Dung Hung Kim via NAMS decision, lost to Rory McDonald uh, via NAMS decision, then went on to defeat uh, Conor McGregor via Renegade choke, and then lost in the rematch via majority decision, then defeated Anthony Pettis via NAMS decision. So a total record of four victories and three losses at 170 pounds. His strike, 75%. Of his strikes are to the head, 16% are to the body, and only 4% are to the head to the to the leg. That says a lot right there. And he lands 69% uh, of his strikes standing, 23% in the clinch, and only 8% on the ground. A lot of those ground strikes are trying to set up submissions, or I have you locked in a submission, let me smack you around a couple times. That's the kind of guy Nate Diaz is. 
But that says something right there. 23% of his strikes are in the clinch. He leads forward with this head. He's got one of the most predictable styles, and that's not a knock on Nate Diaz. What I'm trying to say with the most predictable style is the fact that he will walk you down, put pressure on you, force you on your back foot, and that limits the amount of power strikes that you're going to be able to land. That's, in my opinion, is why Nate Diaz is able to absorb so many hard strikes. Number one, because of his conditioning. Two, because he's Nate Diaz, West Coast gangster. And number three, the fact that he leads with his head all the time, forces fighters on their back foot. And when they connect, most of the time it's on the top of the head. So I think the second Nate Diaz starts backing up a little bit, it's going to be serious problems with Nate Diaz. But every time he steps forward, every time he puts the pressure on, it's going to cause a lot of problems for Jorge Masvidal. He landed 1,311 significant strikes in his UFC career with a 44% accuracy. He lands 4.64 significant strikes per minute and absorbs 3.69 as a 46% takedown defense rate. Again, most people knock on that, but again, 12 submission victories. He doesn't care if he gets knocked down or taken down. He's the second-degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He's taking on number three ranked Jorge Masvidal. He's got a record of 11 victories with six losses in his UFC career. He's gone six and four since his return to 170 pounds in the UFC, defeating Cesar Ferreira via round one knockout, lost to Benson Henderson via split decision, lost to Lorenz Larkin via split decision, defeated Ross Pearson via unanimous decision, defeated Jake Ellenberger via round one TKO, defeated Cowboy Cerrone via round two TKO, lost to Damian Maia via split decision. Again, something worth noting. The reason why I don't have Nate Diaz... Um, Defeating Jorge Masvidal via submission is the fact that Jorge Masvidal was able to defend the vast majority of the of the submission attempts of uh, Damian Maya. He had Damian Maya on his back for, I believe, over half a round and was smiling, giving thumbs up to his corner. That's the kind of guy that uh, Jorge Masvidal is. He's a very tough guy to submit. Um, he also went on to lose to Wonderboy via uh, unanimous decision. Then went on to defeat Darren Till via round two TKO. And then defeated Ben Askren via five-second knockout back at UFC 239. That was nuts. He was also 3-1 in strike force and lost, um, lost in his title shot against Gilbert Melendez, Nate Diaz's teammate back in, um, back in the late days of the, uh, strike force, of the strike force organization. He also went 2-1 in Bellator in the early days of Bellator. He hasn't been finished since 2009. Uh, where he lost to Tony Amada via inverted triangle choke at Bellator 5 back in 2009. He's got nine decision losses, five of those being split decision. By the way, Jorge Masvidal, I've called him king of the split decision losses. Uh, he's a 2004 Naga Ch Chicago champion, um, or Chicago Pro Am second place. Uh, he's landed 852 total strikes in his UFC career, 4.11 significant strikes landed per minute, and absorbs 4.18. Landed 15 to 31 takedowns, has a 78% takedown defense rate. Um, of his strikes, 70% are standing, 17% are in the clinch, and 13% are on the ground. 62% to the head, 24% to the body, and 14% to the legs. This is going to be a stand-up fight. If anybody tries to take the fight down to the ground, it's the jiu-jitsu game that will prevail. It's one of the most fun stand-up fights that we'll ever see. It's going to be one of the more fun grappling matches that we'll ever see. This is going to be a good fight, ladies and gentlemen. And that is it. UFC 244 in total. That went really long because that's exactly what I wanted from this from this preview show, actually. I wish I had a little bit more interaction with you guys. I kind of got carried away because this kind of went on a little bit long. Get mastery and delivery of the facts. Mega could use a man like you. Jeez. I appreciate it, though. Thank you. Bro, I don't know who Pete is. All the love, bro. Just chilling here, having fun. No, Pete was a... Uh, it's He was a troll that we had on the last show. He was a troll that we had on the last show, and I put I made him look stupid and banned him. That's basically what happened there. I was Jorge's cardio versus Nate's cardio. I will not knock on Jorge Masvidal's uh, cardio because he knocks people out in five seconds. Um, that being said, I honestly don't know the last time that he's fought five rounds. Nate Diaz, we know, can go five rounds, um, but that's going to be a very interesting factor. I don't believe Jorge Masvidal will get gassed in this fight. However, the reason why I have Jorge Masvidal win this fight via Ganam's decision, that's a tough one. That is a tough one to predict. Um, I'm picking Masvidal because I think he just has a slight edge over Nate Diaz in many different departments. I think he's just a little bit more powerful than Nate Diaz. I think that will cause Nate Diaz a lot of problems. However, Nate Diaz's antidote to this is his forward pressure, the constant forward pressure that he has. He's a tough guy to land a, land a hard shot on. And um, 
However, I just think Corey Monsville is just a little bit bigger framed. I think it will cause Nate Diaz a little bit more problems. But these are two guys that I will never bet against. However, one thing I will for sure bet on, I got two fights um, that I'm picking for fight of the night. Hakeem Dewadu, early on in their fight, early on in the UFC fight card. I'm already forgetting. Julio Arce against Hakeem Dewadu. Very first fight on the card, I believe, will be fight of the night. And they will be competing with Jorge Masvidal against Nate Diaz for fight of the night. I truly believe that. Performance of the night picks that I have, Johnny Walker and Derek Lewis. Um, if I had to pick a car, pick two fights, two fighters in particular that will t- take away a performance of the night bonus, Johnny Walker and Derek Lewis. Possibly Kellen Gastelum as a, uh, as a uh, or Edmund Shabazian even, as a possible replacement, I guess you could call it, as a backup. The table conducts noise on the mic. Yes, Chris, I promise I will have a cloth underneath it for the fight card. I promise. I forgot to do that. I'm reminding myself now. Lewis for a KO. Always steps up. He's got Nick in his corner. Nick in his corner. That's, I'm not sure exactly how big of a factor that will have. It's interesting, nonetheless. The, 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 if Nate Diaz is able to maintain the performance that he had against Anthony Pettis in his last fight, he's a very dangerous fighter. I'm just going with Maury Masvidal. He was the best UFC player by play. I appreciate it, Matt. Agreed, Matt. I appreciate it, y'all. Nick is the original BMF. You want to talk BMF, though? There are some honorable mentions on this card. Blagoy Ivanov is taking on uh, Andrei Arlovsky. Blagoy Ivanov was literally stabbed in the heart, was placed in Bulgaria, was placed into placed into a medically induced coma, went on six months after that, we went four straight. <laughs> Darren Till stabbed twice in the back, lived one millimeter away f- from severing the uh, aortic artery, would have died, is now fighting the coma main event, fought for the 170 pound championship. There is some honorable mentions. Andre Arlovsky is an honorable mention BMF. He's been in the UFC since 2000. Was a former heavyweight champion at UFC, I want to say 30, where he defeated Tim Sylvia to win the interim championship and eventually was inaugurated the uh, undisputed UFC heavyweight champion way back in the day. Was cut from the UFC. Was was cut from every major organization that he had, that he had been a part of. And eventually had a complete comeback. And now he's still fighting. And it's 2009, almost 2020. Do you want to talk about honorable mention BMF? Andre Arlovsky right there. Johnny Walker breaks his body in celebrating. I'm not sure if that qualifies him to be an honorable BMF. I don't know. Um, who else? Is there any other honorable BMFs on this card? Derek Lewis. Honorable BMF. No doubt about it. But By the way, Blago Ivanov is taking on Derek Lewis. I had that flipped. My bad. Um, I think that's the all, all the honorable mentions that I have. For the BMF. Anyway, I'm exhausted, guys. I got to get some sleep tonight. I got to do some work for the fight uh, fight live stream tomorrow. It's been great. Thank you guys for showing up. I really appreciate you guys watching. This is almost two hours long. Um, but I'll tell you what. It's all going to be worth it. Please tune in tomorrow night. Man, it's tomorrow night. I can't wait for it. But anyway, I got to let you guys go. This is Tyler from TMMA, and I'll catch you all later. I'll see you all tomorrow night i can't wait for it please tune in and please if you're able to buy the pay-per-view you'll regret it if you don't but anyway i'll catch you guys later